Great, thank you so much. Uh, welcome everybody. I'm gonna bring to order uh, tonight's meeting for the Housing Authority of the City of Salem for Monday, November 14th, 2022. Would the recorder please call the roll? Commissioner Nishioka. Present. Commissioner Phillips. Here. Commissioner Leung. Commissioner Gonzalez. Here. Commissioner Hoy. Here. Commissioner Nordyke. Commissioner Nordyke. Here. Commissioner Varney. Here. Chair Stapleton. I'm here. Thank Great, thank you. Um, I'm going to ask uh, that Commissioner Nordyke lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I'm sorry, I'm having some challenges on my feet. I think you were about to ask me to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Is that right, Madam Chair? It is, thank you so Great. much. Everyone already has their hands on their shirts. So I kind of, that was kind of the, the teaser trailer, if you will. My apologies all. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you so much. Well, tonight we um, have the election of our vice chair. So I am going to ask if we have any nominations out there. Yes, um, Councillors, uh, Commissioner Stapleton, I would uh, move to nominate Commissioner Trevor Phillips to serve as the Vice Chair of the Housing Authority Commission. Thank you. Second. Great. So we have a motion by uh, Commissioner Nishioka and a second by Commissioner Leung. Is there any discussion? Would you like to speak to your motion? Go ahead, Councillor. Thank you. I just wanted to say that I believe that Trevor Phillips has demonstrated outstanding character while serving for two years as a commissioner on the Housing Authority and as a city councilor. I believe he will prove to be an excellent vice chair for the Housing Authority Commission. Thank you. Is there anybody else? I, yeah. Commissioner Nordic. Thank you. Sorry, I forgot to wait to be recognized because uh, I too want to jump and offer my enthusiastic endorsement of Councillor Phillips. Uh, Councillor Phillips has the tenacity and the drive and uh, the passion for understanding how important Salem Housing Authority is to our work. Um, City Council does important work, but it's because of how hard Salem Housing Authority works. Those two really have a, an in, inextricable link. And I know Trevor gets that. And I know that he will lead with integrity in this as he does in all endeavors. So, and by the way, I, I also express a full endorsement of you, Commissioner Stapleton. So I think we are in great hands. Thank you so much. I meant to thank everybody for the honor at the beginning of the meeting, but of course with nerves, you just dive right in because that's what I do. But let's focus on our vice chair here. Any other comments? All right, it looks, oh, yes. Just just briefly, not to go out of order. Out of order. Uh, yes, uh, congratulations, uh, Chair, Madam Chair, uh, Commissioner Stapleton. And I'd like to thank my colleagues for their kind oh. words. Um, and I, I am ready and prepared to um, serve if elected. Great, thank you so much. Turn off my emails here from dinging during our meeting. All right, well, I think we just need a roll call now. Would we please call the roll? Commissioner Nishioka. Aye. Commissioner Phillips. Aye. Commissioner Leung. Aye. Commissioner Gonzalez. Aye. Commissioner Hoy. Aye. Commissioner Nordyke. Aye. Commissioner Barney. Aye. Chair Stapleton. Aye. Motion passes. Congratulations. I know you're going to do a great job and I'm looking forward to working with you, um, especially with so much going on at the Housing Authority and uh, the real crisis in housing that we have in our city right now. So um, this should be a lot of fun, right? That's yes, why we do thank this. Thank you. Yes. All right. Well, uh, Vice Chair, do we have any um, additions or deletions? Madam Chair, we do not. Thank you so much. We have nobody signed up for public comment. Vice Chair Phillips, the consent calendar. 
Yes, I move approval of the consent calendar. I'll second. Thank you. We have a motion by Phillips and a second by Nishioka. Uh, Councillor Phillips. So consent calendar items include uh, 3.1A, the October 24th, 2022 draft Salem Housing Authority minutes. Uh, they include 3.3A, uh, amendment to the annual contributions contract. 3.3B, uh, agreement for the Salem Housing Authority to serve as the general manager of the 27th Avenue Apartments Limited Partnership. 3.3C, uh, agreement for the Salem Housing Authority to serve as the general manager for Gateway Phase 2 LLC and the CDP Gateway Phase 2 LLC. Um, and that concludes the consent calendar. Great, thank you. There is a lot of really great stuff on this consent calendar. Does anybody have any discussion before we vote on this? Yes, Commissioner Leung. Thank you. Um, I had a question specifically about item, um, which one is it? 3.3B, the agreement for Sam Housing Authority for the 27th Avenue Apartments Limited Partnership. Um, if this is not the right space to be asking this question, please let me know. But this has to do with page three, um, specifically that the, um, the residents will benefit from a full suite of services provided by Mono a Mono, a culturally specific services organization based in Salem. Is there a contract anywhere within here that we could take a look at seeing what kind of uh, agreement Mono a Mono is providing uh, to residents? Thank you. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm Nicole Hughes and I'm the Housing Administrator for Salem Housing Authority. That's a great question and I'm happy to uh, provide that. I don't have that tonight for you, but I will definitely get that back to you. Uh, typically the resident services revolve around both uh, financial education. Um, this is not a permanent supportive housing complex. So this is on site or this will be so supporting residents at um, when they're when it's needed at the location, um, much like we do at our Parkway apartments here in Salem. Uh, whenever a resident needs additional assistance with childcare, transportation needs, medical, um, providing, uh, trying to get signed up for organ health plan or food stamps, uh, those are all the typical resident services that are provided. And it uh, does sound like they, they must have a um, memorandum of understanding with Mono and Mono to help provide those. Okay, so um, this is uh, Councilor Leung again. Um, just to be clear, um, there is a signed um, agreement then between the developer and Mono and Mono to be able to make this happen? Like there's actually like a signed, something signed somewhere. That would have been an agreement that was provided to Oregon Housing and Community Services with their application process for their low income housing tax credits. But nothing that on our city of Salem and that we would be able to take a look at then. Uh, I'm happy to provide that. I unfortunately don't have it for you to provide it tonight, but I can circulate it out for everybody to take a look at. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you so much. Uh, Commissioner Nordic. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Ms. Utes, I had a few questions as well. So for two of our consent agenda items, you are requesting approval to serve as general manager of Gateway, as well as the other property, the Mahonia Hall property. And my question really just goes to bandwidth. Uh, I know that you came to us recently with an ask for 10 additional staff to manage your work and expand your work so that you can apply for grants and do more. I just wanna make sure we're not biting off more than we can chew. Um, can you give me a sense of your capacity to handle the general management duties for these two uh, projects in addition to uh, the impressive uh, caseload that you folks already have? Certainly. So Nicole Yates again, housing administrator. I would be happy to explain. So the general manager is not like the Salem Housing Authority is actually managing the complex or doing the day-to-day -day operations. This means that we're in general manager agreement that we will come out and we will do a compliance uh, oversight of the project on an annual basis. We will go through files to ensure that they are accurately um, 
complying with the requirement to keep the units affordable uh, at the various different levels what each of these projects are requiring. We also do an on-site inspection. So we will go in a handful of the different apartments, a selected amount that we typically choose that a uh, few days in advance to ensure that the tenants get proper notice. And then we also um, stay in compliance with these properties throughout the year if they have questions on our end. But on, beyond that, the housing authority is indemnified. We're not a guarantor of the project. We do ensure that they're keeping them affordable and they're keeping them decent, safe, and sanitary and upholding to our uh, requirements for the project itself. But the day-to-day -day operations is handled by the property and the developer themselves. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, I have a follow-up, if I may. Go ahead. And can you tell us the status of the 10 positions that we approved? Have you had an opportunity in this job market to fill those vacancies? Absolutely. So we have some exciting news. We have filled both of our assistant housing administrator positions. Unfortunately, they are not on tonight. One is actually at an affordable housing conference in Chicago, and the other one was off on vacation. We have promoted Melanie Fletcher, who has been a compliance manager in the industry for over 30 years, into the affordable uh, assistant housing administrator of operations for the housing authority. That is going to be our day-to-day -day operations side, meaning the property management maintenance and voucher program. Uh, and then we've hired Jessica Blakely as the assistant housing administrator of strategy and innovation, which is our development side, which is also our finance team and our compliance and both come very skilled. Jessica has been in the industry over 20 years and um, we're excited to have them both on as well as that we've been able to fill about six other positions and we're currently in the process right now of four additional positions for the property management team. So we're making great headway and we've really picked up in our application process since we uh, appreciate your support in making this happen with our salary comparable study as well as our strategic planning. Um, it has made a great ease in our operations here and everybody's starting to see some of the effects of it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner Phillips, or Vice Chair, sorry, Vice Chair Phillips. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so uh, I don't have any questions tonight, but uh, well done, uh, Director uh, or Administrator uh, Nicole Utz. And thank you for being here and for your ongoing work to make a difference uh, across our community. I just wanna say that I'm, I'm really excited about you know all of the consent calendar, but especially 3.3B and 3.3C. Um, you know, between those two uh, different items, you know, we're looking at over 220 new units in the city of Salem. And if my math is correct, a little over 200 defined affordable uh, housing units. Um, and I, I just couldn't be more excited. Um, you know, we, we got a peek, uh, Chair uh, uh, Stapleton and I got a peek behind the scenes meeting with you, Nicole Utz, and, and your leaders uh, a week or two ago. And it's just incredible to learn in even more detail the work that's been ongoing for years and the new work that's coming online, you know, recently and in the near future. So there's more happening than people realize. And this is just another really important step. I, I really look forward to voting for this and, and seeing this come to fruition for our, the members of our community. Thank you. Thank you so much. Very well said. Is there any other uh, question, uh, comments? Okay. Uh, Counselor, sorry, Commissioner Nishioka. Thank you. Um, I had uh, emailed Nicole earlier today, and I had had a question by one of the neighborhood associations that were asking, and um, and Vanessa, uh, Commission, uh, Commissioner Nordyke was also present, and they were asking how many units, affordable units, do we currently have, and how many do we still need? I think some people, you know, you, there's so many different ways to fall into different affordable categories. And I think that sometimes it, it, it's, it is a bit overwhelming. I mean, I don't even know how <laughs> you do all of that you do uh, in the sense that there's many different uh, categories of affordable and, the, and different sites that have affordability and some that are mixed with market rate. So I think the basic question was trying to get an understanding of how many more units do we need to build to help support the community 
that needs this service. And so um, I'm going to go ahead and let Nicole, she was kind enough to provide me with many documents, but I believe that she will be able to just kind of, you know, summarize and give us some information. Certainly. So I wanted to, I do get this question asked of me frequently at various different um, events. I will tell you that there are over 3,000, almost 3,500 affordable housing units in the Salem area, Mar I should say Marion County area. It's uh, difficult to drill down to specific areas. There are so many different affordable housing. There's permanent supportive housing, there's low income housing tax credits, there's Section 8 project base, there's rural developments, there's a vast variety. So it's always difficult to answer this question as to exactly how many affordable units there are in the community because they all come with various different levels of what is considered affordable. But I can tell you that over the course of the next 20 years, um, through the data and research that I have been able to conduct through all the various programs with Oregon Housing and Community Services reports, um, I they are indicating that we need approximately 11,000 additional affordable housing units in the Salem-Kaiser area over the next 20 years to keep up with the shortage and capacity that we are, are needing for this community. It's, there's over 140,000 affordable housing units that are needed in the state of Oregon alone to keep up with the capacity in Oregon for the shortage that we have. Some of that's been impacts from the wildfire uh, conditions that we've seen a couple of years ago. So we do try to follow these trends and part of the reason why it was so important for us to get an assistant housing administrator for strategy and innovation on our development side so that we can come up with more creative and innovative ways to be able to produce this, this amount of uh, stock that we're going to need to ensure that we can help our community. I can tell you through our general manager agreements that with these two new resolutions, that'll equal over 811 affordable units that we're in partnership with for the Housing Authority. There is no way that we could have built that in the amount of time that has, has been, these partnerships have been in place. Um, so in the Housing Authority alone, we have built over two, we're in the process of building 200 apartments currently to add to our stock. So we need to continue this pace to ensure that we have affordable housing, but we are not the only affordable housing provider in the Salem community, and we're looking at ways to partner to, to increase those numbers. Thank you so much. Madam yes. Chair, thank you. Oh, just a yes. follow-up comment. Uh, Nicole, again, I want to just say you are doing amazing work, and we all sincerely thank you for all of those efforts. I appreciate these numbers, and I can go back to the Neighborhood Association and give them some numbers and reassure them that we, or Housing Authority, is really doing a fantastic job. There's still much work to do, but we are getting it taken care of. Thank you. Thank you. And um, Commissioner Nordyke, is this about, um, I want to make sure that we can close out the vote on the consent calendar. I know we're going to have time later for questions. Um, both Nordyke and uh, Liang, is this about the consent calendar that we're going to vote on? Or can it wait until we go to information reports? We can wait to information reports, Commissioner. Okay, thank you so much. I'll be sure to I, call on you first. Sorry. You're fine. And um, Commissioner Liang? Is this about consent calendar? Um, this had a few more questions relating to 3.3b, but I guess we could wait till consent calendar if that's where we could ask more questions. Um, no, if it's about the consent calendar, you can go ahead and ask okay. the question. Okay. So it's, again, relating to 3.3b, um, 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 I, I know uh, Dr. Uchi mentioned that you were going to send to us the um, agreement that was between Mono Mono and um, the developers in question. Um, the other uh, question I had specifically was when I was reading through this, like this one specifically for 3.3b, it's a 10-year contract, correct? And um, second question, after that, it could be renewed on an annual basis. So one-year basis until one of you decide you don't want to do it anymore, but you have to do 120 days um, notice. That's correct. So I want to also identify that we're not the deciding factor on the tax exemption. Marion County uh, Tax Assessor's Office is the one who does the final um, allocation of whether they're going to make these tax exemptions possible or not. So we 
provide the general partnership and then they have to actually file uh, quite a bit of paperwork with the Marion County Tax Assessor's Office. So the one thing that we always make sure that development partners understand is that we are not the final say in whether the tax exemption uh, status will remain in fact, in a, into effect. We, so far to this time, 10 years is about the max that we are doing on these programs and to ensure that it helps them. And we look at the performance. So we take the performance of this new development and we want to ensure that they're not going to profit off of the fact that they're receiving the tax exemption program, but yet that they're actually able to close this deal because of our partnership to help keep it um, in line, to be able to make it happen for the next five to 10 years and then move on from there. We may not renew it if they're able to sustain on their own. And then of course we want the community to benefit from the tax exemption. Thank you for uh, clarifying Director Oops. Um, I guess where I'm, I, I still have some questions slash concerns is, you know, it's, it's set state specifically, and again, this might be more of the a contract agreement that was submitted to OCHS, um, but like the fact that Mono Mono is just listed in this one really brief blurb, like they're providing cultural specific services based in Salem, and they're a really great organization that provided on multiple occasions, not just the Latinx community, but also to the Asian, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander communities, and also indigenous communities and in, who need um, support services. And I, I'm just trying to see the relationship, like how this developer and Mano a Mano, like how they're working together. But I think that's outside the scope of what we're discussing tonight. That's correct. So our tax exemption program doesn't require the services. That is something that we are looking to expand upon with our additional uh, capacity here in strategic planning. But the current tax exemption program requires that the units remain under a certain affordability factor. So I, I apologize, but we did not request additional information related to that. that blurb was probably more specific to their low income housing tax credit application, which they do have to verify with Oregon Housing and Community Services. Thank you very much. But I'll still be happy to follow up. Thank you so much. Okay, I think we are going to go ahead and call the roll on the consent calendar. Vice Chair Phillips. Aye. Commissioner Leon. I, I still have reservations about 3.3B, though. That's it. Commissioner Gonzalez? Aye. Commissioner Hoy? Aye. Commissioner Nordyke? Aye. Commissioner Barney? Aye. Commissioner Nishioka? Aye. Chair Stapleton? Aye. Motion passes. All right. Thanks, everyone. That was a good uh, discussion. We probably <laughs> we probably should have, have uh, pulled it and had a, a, a more robust conversation about that one, but I think um, I hope that staff can can meet with Commissioner Liang and answer all of her questions, and uh, maybe even forward on the information to the rest of the commission so that we're all on the same page there. Um, we have no public hearings tonight or special orders of business, um, but we do have an information report that was full of an amazing list of things that our housing authority does on a regular basis. Um, and uh, kind of a peak, a day in the life of somebody who uh, works there at the Salem Housing Authority. And it really was great to see. Um, I will ask um, Nicole, uh, if you have any updates for us, if you wanna just give us a brief um, rundown on things and then maybe we can have some questions. Thank you. Again, Nicole is Housing Administrator. I just wanted to provide this snapshot is something that actually our operations uh, administrator, assistant housing administrator of operations is now compiling on a monthly basis. And I found it so intriguing to be able to quantify the amount of data that comes out of this um, agency on a monthly basis, but also put into perspective that the Salem Housing Authority is running off of three different fiscal years. So a little bit of history about us we have the city of Salem's fiscal year, we have our federal fiscal year, and then our affordable housing projects are on uh, a, a yearly fiscal year. So just to put into mind frame, the accountants aren't listed in here, but they do an amazing job of keeping up with all of the audits involved. And it feels literally like we live in an audit all year round with this many different fiscal years. 
and closing of all these different projects that we have going. So everything that's touched here that you guys hear about, there's somebody behind the scenes that's touching a piece of paper or a document or a check that's going out in the mail to help make this all happen. And I felt like this maybe gives a better understanding of how much that all of the different staff members do at the agency on a daily basis. The only other comment that I wanted to make because I get this question frequently and we are looking at ways to improve this program management report uh, to make it easier to understand is that in our HRAP statistics, there is two sections. There's called enrolled and they're served. So the individuals that are listed under enrolled were actually at one point qualified as an HRAP homeless rental assistance candidate um, through the coordinated entry program. The served means that person came with additional family members, whether that is a girlfriend, a child, a, a boyfriend, wife, a caregiver. We're also serving them by doing the, the, the work of the Homeless Rental Assistance Program. So I wanted to care, make sure that everybody understands the two different rows that are there is really the, the enrollees and the additional in, individuals that we're serving by the program. Thank you for clarifying that. It's always good to, to get a little bit more um, or refreshers along the way to remember just what all of these different um, titles and, and buckets all, all mean. Um, bef before we open it up to questions, I do wanna congratulate um, Ms. Oots. Uh, she was nominated as the president of the Housing Authority, am I saying this right? Housing Authority of Oregon? Yes, that's okay. correct. So congratulations to you. Um, I know that you are gonna do a fantastic job. Um, I'm a little nervous that people are gonna see how amazing you are and come try to steal you from us. Um, so I, I, I just wanna put that out there. Um, we, <laughs> we need you here and we really appreciate your work. Um, there's so much that we could speak about, um, but I want to make sure to open it up to anybody else who has any further questions. I think we wanted to start with Commissioner Nordyke, if you still have your question. Yes, I did. And it was really more of a comment prompted by what Commissioner Nishioka brought up. So as I understand it, we need 11,000 more units approximately. Is that right, Ms. Utes? Yes. It, over and, the course of the next 20 years, I should say. Oh, Thank you. Um, I would recommend to folks, there's a book that came out recently called Homelessness is a Housing Problem. And in that book, it stated that th there's no state in the union right now that has sufficient affordable housing. They said that West Virginia is the only state with 60 affordable and available homes for every 100 households who need them. Uh, Oregon, in contrast, has fewer than 30 units for every 100 households in need. Uh, California, Nevada, and Arizona are all in the same boat, about 30 units for the 100 that are needed. So I think it helps to contextualize and realize that affordability of housing is a national problem. And the more we can get federal legislators to recognize that, I mean, for a few couches in the federal budgeting cushions, a uh, few coins in their couch cushion, we could make a huge dent in affordable housing. But we here at the city level do everything we can with the budget we have to make it happen. So um, I just hope that's helpful for folks who uh, are interested. Once again, that book is Homelessness is a Housing Problem and I highly recommend it. That hard data is really fascinating. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. I know, especially with the bond passing, I know we'll talk about this more at council, but the, that affordable housing uh, bucket in the bond, um, that will be interesting to talk about uh, later uh, with the housing authority and on this commission. I'm not sure how that will all you know, shake out, but it is um, uh, a passion of mine and something that I'm really paying attention to much like the rest of you here. Commissioner Gonzalez. Thank you, Chair Stapleton. You know, this may not answer uh, Commissioner Leon's question, but uh, FHDC, former housing development corporation, they own affordable units all across the valley. They own Colonia Libertad, which is near the intersection of Lancaster and, and Highway 22. And Mano Mano has been providing um, resident services for at least a decade. You know, so um, 
whether or not we have the information, we can get the information through the city, but reaching out to FHTC will give you uh, maybe more clarity because I don't know everything they do, but I know they've been there. They provide food boxes directly on site. They have offices on site. They just do, they're right there. So it's, it's been really um, a great partnership there. Thank you. Yeah, that is somebody I have not yet met with um, as, a, as an elected official. And I would love to learn more about Mono a Mono and find out what they're doing. They just seem like they're everywhere and doing a lot of good work. Um, so I'll have to I'll have to do that, get that on my list. Commissioner Leanne. Um, thank you. Um, so I, I, I'm, my organization, has, my nonprofit has partnered with Mono a Mono before, so we're very familiar with the services that Mono a Mono has provided. It was just um, surprising to um, see Mono a Mono listed here and, and, and you know, as a, a providing cultural specific uh, programming with just like one re really brief, brief blurb and without more details in terms of what that might consist of. But again, that wasn't for the purposes of us um, coming to voting on this particular issue. But for me, it's just, you know, is this an actual partnership or is this more like check, check mark kind of situation? And as for the farm work development housing project, um, that organization, um, the, the executive director, um, Meg, uh, Meg and I have been actually trying to meet for the past a month or so, but because of illness and a few other things that sort of kept us away from each other, you know, the goal is still to meet with Meg and talk about like what the farm worker development housing um, have done and like how we might be able to replicate that, especially among other cultural specific groups and actually increase housing opportunities for members of our community. Thank you. Great, thank you. Well, if we have no other questions, or comments. All right, seeing none, um, our meeting is adjourned. Thank you so much, everybody. Good evening. Uh, I will call this order or this meeting of the Salem City Council for Monday, November 14th, 2022 to order. If the recorder will please call the roll. Councillor Stapleton. Here. Councillor Nishioka. Present. Present. Councillor Phillips. Here. Councillor Leung. Here. Councillor Gonzalez. Here. Councillor Hoy. Here. Councillor Nordyke. Here. Councillor Varney. Here. Mayor Hoy. Here. All right. Uh, Councillor Stapleton, do we have any additions or deletions to the agenda? Not tonight. Thank you. It's time for Councillor comments. I was listening in on your uh, housing authority meeting. And I would just note that I actually have a visit scheduled uh, to Colonia Libertad uh, this Thursday at 9.30 a.m. If any, And I think Councillor uh, Gonzalez uh, is scheduled to attend as well. And uh, if any two more of you would like to join me, please reach out and we could probably do that. And others we could schedule another time for as well. But at 9.30 uh, this Thursday, let me know if you'd like to join us. You're welcome to do so. Uh, also on uh, Councillor comments, um, I want to congratulate Councillor Linda Nishioka for completing the New York Marathon recently. That's an amazing feat, and uh, that's a good job. That's uh, that's an amazing, amazing feat. I know you trained for it a long time, and you did a great job and made us all proud. Thank you for doing Thank that. You. Should I should I go and grab my medal real quick and show it? You can do that <laughs> while I'm still talking. If you want to do it for your council <laughs> comments, you're more than welcome to. You bet. Uh, and also, I just wanted to also acknowledge that um, Councillor Stapleton and I, along with the city manager and our oh, there it is. There's the medal. <laughs> I can't. I guess it doesn't want to show up very well, but there it is. I could just wear it. <laughs> that's, that's awesome. Thank you, Councillor. <laughs> Thank you very much. So I was just wanting to acknowledge this morning, uh, Councillor Stapleton, uh, City Manager Staley, and Chief Womack. Uh, we uh, we all went over to the uh, to Bush Elementary in honor of uh, the Ruby Bridges Walk to School Day. And to tell you a little bit more about that, at just six years old, Ruby Bridges led a courageous first step in American civil rights history. On November 14, 1960, she was escorted into France Elementary School by four white federal marshals into an all-white school in Louisiana, marking an important milestone to end segregation policies in schools in the South. In 2018, in San Mateo County, California, the students helped pass a resolution to have Ruby Bridges Walk to School Day recognized every year. 
the recognition of her story is now being celebrated every year throughout the United States on Ruby Bridges Walk to School Day. Today, we commemorated her, ba her bravery by celebrating Ruby Bridges Walk to School Day uh, by joining the Safe Routes to School uh, folks, the Salem Kaiser Public Schools and Bush Elementary, the entire student body at Bush Elementary uh, on the Walk to School Day. And it was really a wonderful experience. Um, Mrs. Nubia Green is the principal there and all of her students were just amazing. We did a walk around Aldrich Park and back around to Bush Elementary. It was really a great event and I encourage others to, to do that next year if you're interested. One final thing I wanted to just mention, um, congratulations to the residents of Salem, to the business owners, to everybody who, who visits Salem on passing our bond measure. And thank you all to all the amazing work for making that happen. I specifically wanna call out Salem 350, uh, the Salem Chamber, especially Executive Director Tom Hoffert, the Home Builders Association and the Salem Professional Firefighters who all endorsed the measure and helped with uh, uh, the campaign to make sure that it passed. Uh, the executive director of the chamber, Tom Hoffert and I went out on the, the speaking tour and we, we got to uh, talk to many uh, community organizations over the past couple of months to try to uh, increase awareness of this bond. And I, I was always confident it was going to pass. I was not predicting 65% of the vote, however. And that's a real testament to the amazing work that this council did in engaging with our community, finding out what the priorities are and coming up with a comprehensive bond package that really spoke to the hearts and minds of our residents. Uh, and we have a community investment that is going to be a game changer uh, for the next 10 years. And I am so excited for that. And now I will call on Councilor Stapleton. Thank you so much. I'm trying to lower my hand here. Um, yeah, I wanted to start off by thanking voters as well. Um, how exciting um, to wake up and see the numbers when they were uh, finally tallied and see that 65% was just mind blowing. Um, just really a big endorsement uh, for me personally. You know, sometimes you feel a little isolated from people, even though you try and get out in the public, but to have that kind of vote come through is really an endorsement that the folks here in town are excited about what we're doing, the direction we're going, um, the things that we're prioritizing. So um, just really uh, felt great uh, to see that come through and I'm so excited uh, to get started on the next phase. Um, I also wanted to thank Salem Kaiser Public Schools and the Salem PD for the extra work in keeping our kids safe. Uh, we had, uh, for those of you who don't know, there was a um, a threat that came about Parish Middle School and Houck uh, Middle School, and uh, they did the, the great work of helping uh, address it with all the parents and uh, showing up and doing some extra work today and, and making us all feel comfortable. My kiddos go to Parish, so it was an, uh, it was an interesting morning, uh, but um, they, they're doing good, and school was great today. Um, I also wanted to mention that we had um, a tree planting here in my neck of the woods. And that was with the uh, City of Salem Public Works staff, um, a representative from the Ike Box, and a few folks from um, the Care Corps group, the kids that are participating in that program that we have. Uh, they all came out, and uh, I signed up to volunteer as well with my kiddo, and we planted eight trees here along Capitol Street, and um, it really was a fun uh, afternoon. And uh, really great to see how our city staff is interacting with the youth there and how they're using all of these as teachable moments. And um, I just felt uh, really excited about participating in that. Um, one other thing that I got to do was attend um, the Marshallese American Veterans Day event. Um, and this was something that they asked um, Mayor Hoyt to come and, and welcome them and, and kind of do an opening speech for their event. And he was unable to attend. So I had the honor of going um, and doing that. And uh, before I went, I did some homework and uh, tried to figure out, uh, you know, uh, you know, who are these people and and how um, how does this how do our countries interact together? And, um, you know, I wanted to be prepared walking into a cultural event. Um, to make sure that um, I knew as much as I could um, going into it. And I learned a lot. Um, I learned about the Compact of the Free Association that was uh, signed in uh, 1986. And uh, that means that the Marshallese people can come to America and live and study and work without a visa. They are consider considered legal non-immigrants. 
And to date, nearly a third of the people from the Marshall Islands have moved to the United States. Um, I learned that they pay taxes, uh, that they serve in the military at higher rates than uh, most states, um, and that they can move about freely um, in the United States. Um, but I also learned that they do not have access to Medicaid, uh, excuse me, Medicare, Social Security, and other federal programs, um, especially the ones for refugees. Um, both Oregon and Washington have made adjustments, and so uh, the Marshallese people living here in Oregon, they have access to the Oregon health care plan. Um, and so we are having seen greater numbers move to Oregon and Washington for those reasons. Um, Salem has a growing population of Marshallese people living here and close to 2,000 kids in our um, Salem Kaiser Public Schools, and it is the third most common language spoken there. Um, and a, a little bit of history here, um, between 1946 and 1958, the U.S. military conducted 67 nuclear tests on this small island chain, including the largest nuclear bomb ever exploded called Castle Bravo. And in an effort to clean up the toxic waste, the U.S. military created what can only be described as a tomb um, to kind of put all the contaminated debris in and um, not only from the islands, but also from the United States where we detonated bombs in Nevada. Um, there is concern, and I got to talk with people about this at the event, uh, that this tomb where all of this uh, contaminated material is now um, is 50 years old and it's starting to leak. Um, and so there was a lot of interesting conversation while I was at the event about that and other issues um, surrounding that. Um, Another interesting fact is that the average elevation of the Marshall Islands is only seven feet. Um, and so climate change was another issue that I talked with folks about. And there were some real concerns about sea level rise there. Um, so at this event, uh, I was able to talk to folks about all of these things and learn even more. Um, I would love to write up a resolution for us to consider uh, to send to the governor um, and even our congressional delegation. Um, that advocates for more services for these folks who have moved to the states, um, but are also, um, we have a, the compact is going to be renewed this next year, um, and so President Biden is going to be doing that work. Um, I would love to uh, send a letter um, just really on behalf of the folks who live here in Salem um, that addresses um, the, the needs that these folks are having. Um, and so I would love to do that work over the coming weeks and bring it forward um, to Mayor Hoy um, and you all and see if it's something that we can do together. Um, it was really a, a meaningful event to go to and I learned a lot. So thank you so much for the opportunity to talk longer than I normally do tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councillor, and thank you for attending that. I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Councillor Nordyke. Thank you so much. So uh, a few quick things. Um, first of all, I want to congratulate the Salem Main Street Association on planning a holiday parade. This is incredibly exciting. I grew up in Salem. I remember participating in the holiday parade with my family, small business. I threw candy out the backseat window as we drove down downtown and it's back. Um, so go to the Salem Main Street Association's website to find out more information, including the parade route. I love holiday spirit and I love opportunities for our community to come together for a free and family friendly event. It's going to be November 26 at 6 p.m. But again, I defer to Main Street Association for details. On our agenda tonight is an ask to help financially assist with making this parade a big success. And I know I will be voting yes. Uh, the second thing I want to mention, I toured Lucille's home recently. Lucille's home is a small nonprofit uh, and it's run by one of our residents in South Salem, Sharon Jones. Uh, Miss Jones and her husband turned their home into a refuge for domestic violence survivors. They moved out of their home and they created it, they turned it into a nonprofit. They got the property tax exemption status. And women and children have been renting rooms in this Lucille's home, which is named after her mother, for about nine years now. They typically stay about six months on average. And Miss Jones and her nonprofit have now hosted 51 families and counting. And they typically stay, as I said, for about six months. And during that time, uh, you have community partners such as Community Action Agency, Center for Hope and Safety, and some of our other great local partners to help provide services to these families. 
and this is a model that can be replicated. So I shared this on my Facebook page and I've gotten some interest on it and I'll be connecting some dots between folks who are interested. But the reality is, is that we can all do our part to address homelessness. Maybe you're not in a position to rent out your entire house or even renting out a room in your home. But there are other ways that people contribute to places like Lucille's home. There's a neighbor next door that helps out with yard work. There's a local uh, house of worship that provides cooked food to help the residents focus on healing and getting back to work. And there's another uh, volunteer who helps by clipping coupons and dropping off laundry detergent for the laundry facility on premises. It's really exciting when I see people think outside the box and be innovative when it comes to addressing homelessness or people who are on the cusp of homelessness. And you can do it in a small way. You can do it in a big way. You can do it your way. So if you're interested in learning more about Lucille's home and whether that might be something you would be interested in getting involved in or replicating yourself, please contact me. Uh, and then last but not least, I want to give a belated uh, happy Veterans Day welcome to everybody. I have two veterans in my family right now. My aunt and uncle served 43 years combined in the Navy. They traveled all over the world and my aunt uh, broke a lot of glass ceilings as she rose through the ranks, became a lieutenant, which was a huge deal. Um, and I also wanted to take this opportunity to remind folks that we administer veterans assistance uh, and housing programs at the Salem Housing Authority. It's called VASH. And right now we are housing 71 veterans through uh, the assistance of BASH vouchers and our partnership with the Veterans Administration for homeless veterans or at-risk veterans. So I want to give a shout out and a kudos to the Salem Housing Authority staff who work with our veterans to ensure they have a safe place to call home. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Gonzalez. Thank you, Council President Hoy, Mayor Hoy. Um, Actually, when I started this, everybody, I wanted to give a shout out to the Salem Public Library staff. They've been hosting Spanish uh, lecture, reading days, nights, and it's been well attended, but on a particular day, they, they did a celebration for Dia de Muertos, and they did a, a Mexican Loteria, which is the Mexican version of bingo. And their goal was to get about 50 people. That was the goal, try to get 50 people. Well, over 110 people showed up. I mean, it, they, we had to do, we had to host uh, the event in the extra breakout rooms, um, fully Spanish event, bilingual. It was just a really, they did a really good job. People felt welcome, they felt happy. And there was a elderly Mexican couple there with their granddaughter and he says, great event, one of the best days that he can remember. You know, so just, I wanted to really applaud the staff of the Salem Public Library, thanks. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you for highlighting that. Councillor Phillips. Thank you, uh, Mayor Hoy, and uh, I'd like to thank so many people, especially, you know, my colleagues here, uh, Mayor Hoy, all of my fellow city councilors, uh, especially City Council President um, Virginia Stapleton. Um, I know that Mayor Hoy and, and Councilor Stapleton uh, joined me uh, at events to bring awareness to the, the bond here in Ward 3 in South Salem. Um, I really want to, you know, thank my colleagues, all of you and, and city staff for, you know, I, I think we we presented a very enticing product. And I really wanna thank the community members of Salem and the voters for um, you know, placing their trust in, in that bond. Um, I think that this really is, is a big deal at the risk of being redundant. I, I am truly grateful and it makes me uh, very encouraged. As I said a couple of weeks ago, you know, one of the two main reasons that I, I wanted to be involved in, on city council is to make a difference in our community on infrastructure. And I think that this gives us a, a really positive step forward and, and some predictability over the next 10 years. So, so thank you. Um, in, in addition to those comments, I, I do wanna, uh, uh, you know, copying is the sincerest for flattery. Uh, thank you, Councillor uh, Nordyke for reminding me. Last week was in fact uh, Veterans Day. And um, I mean, on behalf of all of our community members, uh, past and present who served in the military, including my brother who is a, a major in the Army Reserves who lives here in South Salem, um, you know, thank you for your service to, to our country. 
Um, you know, it's a lot that these family members uh, over their careers do on behalf of our country in terms of sacrifice. Um, and it's a big deal. So really, thank you. Uh, finally, at the risk of, of going back to old patterns, as most of you know, I'm an emergency room doctor and, you know, it's flu season right now. Um, uh, it's it, Maybe it's a bit more normal again to, to just be, you know, seeing, seeing patients having acute or worsening influenza every shift, but I can say that, that it's true. And so uh, if you haven't already, you know, get your flu shots and of course, uh, to continue beating the drum, uh, you know, please, if you can, uh, get fully vaccinated for COVID-19 and, and get the, the booster shots. It's pretty simple right now. Everybody five and up uh, is uh, able to get the new bivalent booster. So I would encourage everyone to do so. Uh, you know, the science is clear, it's safe, it's effective, and it decreases your risk of hospitalization and death. So please help those of us on the front line um, and during these busy winter months by getting yourself protected. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Counselor. And uh... City Manager Staley and I had a recent tour of the, the emergency department and uh, yes, getting your flu shot is really important. I can vouch for that. Um, I also wanted to just make sure that I'm not sure I mentioned in my comments, I wanted to thank, be sure and thank the staff for their amazing work on our bond. I mean, the, the, the great work from the finance department in order to structure it over 10 years, uh, the public work staff, every bit, all the different departments that came together to, to create that list for our for our perusal and uh, and uh, approval, ultimately, I just want to make sure we we shout out to our staff as well and thank them. All right, Councillor Leung. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Mayor Hoy. Um, this is Councillor Leung, and um, quite a few of the my fellow councillors already highlighted some of the things I wanted to talk about. So I'm not going to repeat any of those or try not to. Um, the one thing I just want to emphasize, especially for our residents is that um, especially as we're getting closer to some of the you know, colder months, some people who celebrate the holidays, either in November and or December leading into January, you know, food insecurity is still an ongoing concern, um, especially at some of the food pantry events that my organization has led. We are still seeing high numbers of people attending those. Like our last one that we had at the, earlier this month, we had about 60 something individuals who registered, but that equaled to about 300 um, family or 300 individuals total within those individuals who, who registered. And I just wanted to highlight and remind people that there are programs available to people through the Marion Polk Food Share. So people can go to marionpolkfoodshare.org um, forward slash get dash help dash or not dash um, forward slash. And what's great about um, this webpage is they showcase a list of the different pantries, locations, whether it's in Almsville and Dallas, especially in Salem, and even in Kaiser, it talks about who, which organization or entity or partner does the food pantry, whether it's a home delivery, whether it's only bread distribution or produce distribution and, um, and what days that delivery takes place and or what days a food pantry takes place. So if people need access to resources to know that there are resources um, available to them. And I also kind of want to touch back a little bit on what um, Councillor uh, Stapleton had um, spoke about um, specifically, um, not just for the Marshallese, but for the broader COFA community. So I'm gonna agree. I agree that we should, if possible, uh, produce a letter in support. But instead of just for the Marshallese, for the broader COFA community, for the compact, so people from the Compact of Free Association. This includes the Federated States of Micronesia, so like people from Chuk, people from Ponpe, people from Yap, people from Kashrai, um, also the Republic of Marshall Islands and the Republic of Palau, and. Um, one other key important piece that I think it's um, important to highlight is underneath, under the original COPA compact, it was the agreement was that the US government would provide support and services to low income uh, community members from the COPA nations. And that included access to Medicaid, that included access to SNAP benefits and all the other important aspects that they um, were eligible for. But under the, well, the Welfare Reform Act, so a federal um, change that took place in 1996, it changed their status from once being eligible to now becoming eligible non-citizens. So it wasn't, so for the past 20, 20 plus years, Medicaid was not available to members of the community. States like Oregon, Washington, and Hawaii created a program that would provide for low income um, COVID citizens access to affordable health insurance through a agreement with, uh, with the federal marketplace. 
But then in 2020, December of 2020, when the last stimulus bill was signed, in that 1,000 plus page document, there was one page specifically that included reinstatement of Medicaid for people from the Compact of a Free Association. So all those individuals I had mentioned, and it was signed and approved. So as of 2020, of December 2020, people from the COFA nations should be eligible for Medicaid. But in terms of whether they are able to get equal services across the state, that's where there's another barrier because states like Oregon, states like Washington, and even states like Hawaii, they already had a program in place to be able to support people from the COFA nation. So it was easier of a transition. But then other in other states are still catching up and being able to provide Medicaid services to members of the community and they're experiencing significant barriers and hardships. So I just wanted to um, clarify um, that that key piece and ensuring that if we do write this letter that we are inclusive and include the COPA nations in general, being specific and naming all those six different um, communities. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Nishioka. Thank you, Mayor Hoy. Um, I, I too, um, being redundant, want to just thank all of our voters for believing in, in Salem and to the city staff for all the hard work they did on the bond. So that's, I just really wanted to point that out. I also wanted to um, comment, this changes the subject, um, <clears throat> that I've been hearing and listening to a lot of concerns about traffic safety. It seems to be a conversation that is coming more and more to me about areas, especially around schools, um, where people are driving too fast and that there's, there's a lot of concerns of parents. And I just want you to know that the city is working on a website that people can go and then report these areas and even offer um, suggestions if they have them. And so this website should be coming soon and this will be a great opportunity. Otherwise, if possible, uh, certainly continue to reach out to the counselors, but also to communicate with your neighborhood associations because they have their transportation chairs who work on traffic issues. So I just wanted to um, highlight that because I, again, I've had a lot of emails and calls and personal questions, and I just want people to have a place that they can go so they feel like others are listening. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, City Manager Staley, did you have comments for us this evening? I did, thank you, Mayor Hoy. Um, I am going to try not to be redundant as well, but on behalf of the city staff, I would like to take a moment to thank the council and the community for last week's vote on the community infrastructure bond measure. Uh, thank you to council for your vision and courage in putting this package on the ballot. It is an extraordinary measure and will have impacts in this community for years to come. Uh, there is equity and social justice built into this measure. And in looking at the individual projects that are included in the measure, that's the thing that jumps out for me. And I think that's where our community is gonna to continue to benefit. So thank, thank you to council for just your vision and clarity there. And then thank you of course, to the community for the positive vote and for giving the city your trust. Uh, and we certainly will try not to disappoint you in any way in, in that regard. Last thing I would like to know is that today I had the honor to attend a celebration marking the 40th year of service for one of our employees, uh, Don Romain. He works out at the Willow Lake Wastewater Treatment Plant uh, he is an operator there, and he has been working on that plant since 1982. Uh, if you have not had a chance to visit the Willow Lake facility, I encourage you to reach out, and we will set you up with a tour. It is fascinating. Uh, it is wonderful to see the professionalism and the way that facility is being managed you will be proud to be part of the city of Salem. So that's that's my report for this evening. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mr. Staley, and thank you for highlighting that amazing tenure, 40 years of service to the citizens of Salem. That's that's remarkable, and thank you. I, I, I join you in thanking uh, him for that service. That's that's really remarkable. Are there any other uh, counselor comments? All right, we now then will move on to proclamations. And I would like to start with National Runaway Prevention Month. So I will ask Alyssa Tobin Nelson, who is the Home Youth Services Program Director for Midland Valley Community Action Agency, and Shantae Frisbee, who is the uh, host program manager for Northwest Human Services to turn their cameras on while I read this. And uh, at the end, we, we will send you the formal version of this, but uh, thank you for joining us virtually to, to be here with us tonight and, and highlight this really important, uh, this really important month. So, whereas November is recognized as National Runaway Prevention Month, and November 17th is light the night to bring further awareness to the issue of runaway youth, whereas National Runaway Prevention Month began in 2002 and is presented each year by National Runaway Safe Line, the federally designated national crisis and communication system for youth ages 12 to 21 who have run away and are considering leaving home, I'm sorry, are considering leaving home, or are experiencing homelessness, and whereas runaway youth are often expelled from their home, who, I'm sorry, let me start that one again. Whereas runaway youth are often expelled from their home, have experienced trauma, struggle to meet basic needs, and are at increased danger of falling into high-risk situations, including human trafficking and long-term housing instability, and whereas knowing that every child deserves to live in a safe, loving, and caring environment, Mid Willamette Valley Community Action Agency, the Mid Willamette Valley Homeless Alliance, and the City of Salem are working to raise awareness, support, and resources for young people in the community. And now, therefore, I, Chris Hoy, Mayor of the City of Salem, do hereby proclaim November 2022 as National Runaway Prevention Month and ask the community to observe this month with programs and activities to commit to protecting our youth and recognize November 17, 2022 light the night event dated this 14th day of november 2022 and i would like to ask uh shante and or Alyssa if they have any remarks to share with us uh things you would like to tell us or, or make the community more aware of thank you one in 10 youth between 18 and 25 are homeless a year as well as one in 30 between the ages of 13 and 17. Um, providing our services have made a important impact on the city of Salem, where we have routinely, at least at host, 25 new youth every month who come in and use our services. So it's really important to bring the awareness to how, how much um, this is happening in our own city and raising awareness in that. So we will be holding our candlelight vigil this Thursday um, with the national light the night um, ceremony to kind of raise awareness that this is happening all around us and we see it on a daily practice at host as well as at home. Thank you so much, Shante. And tell us the details if we if people wanted to join you on Thursday, time and location for that? Um, it is going to be at 530 on Thursday um, on the corner of Liberty and Belmont in the host resource center parking lot. Um, it's just a half hour. Um, we're just going to have a little bit of a little bit of a speech on the on the importance and recognition of that, as well as providing hot drinks and probably some cookies or donuts inside our resource center to warm up, um, depending on the weather. Um, but it's definitely a good time to show your solidarity. Um, and even our, some of our clients will be there so they understand that we we stand with them and we stand in making a change. Thank you so much. I'm so glad you're doing that. I hope to make it there. I'll have to check my calendar to see if I'm available. If I am, I will be there. And Alyssa, did you have anything you wanted to share with us? Thank you, Mayor Hoy, and thank you, Shantae. Um, we are excited to join hosts in that candlelight vigil as well. Um, and just to highlight the importance of this month and um, the work that we're doing as a community to partner with these youth and um, just really meet them where, where they're at and meet their needs that, that they've identified. Thank you so much. And, uh, you know, as I just recently was appointed 
this was my first proclamation as the mayor. And uh, it was important to me when I learned that this month was National Runaway Prevention Month. It was really important to me to highlight it in this way. And so I really appreciate you coming down here, helping us um, make people aware of this and for all the important work you're doing in our community. I really appreciate it. Thank you. And the next one that we have is for Small Business Saturday. And I would like to invite Jim Vu, who is the president of the Salem Main Street Association, to turn his, I see he's got his camera on, to receive this proclamation. I'll go ahead and read it. Whereas small businesses form the backbone of our local economy, generating jobs and improving the quality of life for residents. And whereas Small Business Saturday is a nationwide program I'm sorry, nationwide campaign to cultivate business for small merchants on the Saturday after Thanksgiving. And whereas 94% of consumers in the United States value the contributions small businesses make in their community. And whereas the city of Salem supports the efforts of local small businesses and recognizes the critical role they play in our community. And whereas Small Business Saturday will stimulate economic growth locally for small, mer small merchants by following in the tradition of Black Friday and Cyber Monday two of the busiest shopping days of the year. And now, therefore, I, Chris Hoy, Mayor of the City of Salem, do hereby proclaim November 26, 2022, as Small Business Saturday, and urge residents to support small, independently owned businesses and local merchants on this day and throughout the year, dated this 14th day of November, 2022. Thank you for being here, Jim. Did you have any, any thoughts you would like to share with us? Maybe highlight your event coming up later in the month? Yeah, uh, thank you, Mayor Hoy. Uh, I just wanted to let you know, uh, probably accepting this uh, on behalf of small business in Salem. Um, one of the key points to recognize is think about how many sponsorships that have happened for your kids' teams, the jogathons, um, whatever events. Um, I don't see big box stores on the front of those jerseys <laughs> or the back. You're seeing the ice cream shop, the restaurant. Uh, you know, local dentists, doctors, and that big picture. Um, thinking about the impact that makes economically, uh, there is a study that was um, conducted by Civic Economics. And what they looked at is the impact of what every $100 does and where you spend it. Looking at local business, for every $100, $68 of that goes back into the local economy. And when you spend that at a big box store, only $42 of that goes back. That's a 58% difference. I can't emphasize enough how important our small business are to our community. Um, and as we just came off of election, um, to remind our community, uh, know who has your back. And uh, if you wanna recognize, uh, you can vote with your own dollars every single day when shopping local. Thank you, Jim. Um, and we will be sure and send that proclamation to you. I really appreciate it. I know you're gonna be speaking under public comment on an item on our agenda. Do you wanna wait and talk about the holiday celebration at that time? Yeah, I can emphasize Great. that. Perfect. Well, for this proclamation, we're gonna throw a parade for that proclamation, thank you. Awesome. We're gonna call you right back here in just a second, so don't step away from your computer for too far. All right, we'll move on. We have then uh, no presentations. We do have public comment. We have two individuals, or we have one person signed up under uh, general public comment, and we have one person signed up under item number eight. If there's no objection, I would like to move the person up from number eight and let them speak now rather than have to sit through our entire meeting. It's just uh, one, uh, one additional person we'd be hearing from now. Looks like I'm seeing nods. Thank you so much. So I will call uh, Jim Vu forward. Please uh, remind us of the item you're speaking to, your ward or your address, and a reminder that you have three minutes, uh, and be sure and stop at the end of the three minutes. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, my name is Jim Vu. I am the board president for Salem Main Street Association, and I live in Ward 8. Uh, go Mickey. Uh, so wanted to uh, talk about uh, meeting agenda um, and on the consent calendar 3.3E. And what we're looking for is um, support for helping pay for the permits uh, for the parade that's taking place on uh, city declared uh, Small Business Saturday. And uh, November 26th, uh, we have organized a group together uh, that's been all volunteer. Uh, we've had, uh, in, in terms of private donation, uh, over $50,000 have come in from private dollars 
Uh, we've had uh, over 500 hours of volunteer hours. This last Saturday, we began putting up the lights throughout downtown. Um, and we're starting with a small parade, and we'll end it with a uh, little block party on Court Street between Liberty and Commercial uh, with the lighting of the tree uh, that's going to happen. And uh, Mayor Hoy and um, a little jolly green guy from up north is going to be uh, joining him, uh, being lifted up on the fire department truck uh, to light the tree. And I know how Mayor Hoy loves heights. I cannot wait for that moment. So... <laughs> It'll be great. Uh, so just the bigger picture of it all is that Salem Main Street Association has not received any city dollars over the last uh, three years. We were cut out of the budget as the parking tax dollars have decreased. Uh, this is a large community-wide event. Uh, we're welcoming in any and everybody to come and celebrate in this um, private dollars have come in to support this wholeheartedly, including the Chamber of Commerce. Um, and we're all coming together. We need events like this. It's outdoors. Um, it's going to be absolutely wonderful, uh, the celebrations and the amount of support. I mean, I had 40 volunteers show up 8 o'clock on a Saturday, this last Saturday to help uh, put up lights. Uh, it's a commitment from the city and um, ask that uh, for your support in helping us pay for all the city fees uh, as we have uh, overall paid about 17, we have the total bill right now is 17,000 um, and would love help uh, from the city to be able to take care of those fees. So that's all I've got, 45 seconds remaining. Save it for another day. Awesome, thank you, Mr. Vu. And for the record, it's not the heights that bother me so much, it's the shaking of that basket. This will be my second time up in that thing. It's the shaking that gets you every time. Hey, Councilor Stapleton. Thank you so much. Um, I'm with you on that, Mayor Hoy. I, no thanks. Um, but thank you for taking one for the team and lighting that tree for us all. Um, I just wanted to thank you, Jim, for coming down here and providing com uh, comment on this. Um, I got to attend one of the Salem Main Street Association meetings and see the designs for um, what they're planning for downtown. And I'm telling you, it's very exciting. Um, I cannot wait. I feel like downtown is a buzz lately with all of the construction and, and just the changing vibe down there. Um, the outdoor dining, just so many different new things happening. Um, and this is just going to further that cause. And so Thank you so much for what you're doing for our downtown, for our city. Um, I can't wait to celebrate as a community. Um, you know, coming out of COVID, this is really important to me to celebrate as a community um, and uh, really look forward to voting for this uh, when it's on the consent calendar. So thanks so much. Thank you, Councillor. Any other questions or comments for Mr. Vu? All right, thank you for coming down, Mr. Vu. We really appreciate it. Looking forward to seeing you uh, soon. All right, and then uh, Tom Hoffert. Thank you for being here, Mr. Hoffert. Reminder, if you give us your word, and you have three minutes. And also, now that you have your, your hearing with your camera, I just wanna again reiterate my thanks for the Chamber's strong support of our bond measure and for your personal commitment to going out on the speaking tour with me and uh, speaking to, I don't know how many groups we spoke to, but it was quite a few. And it was, I think, a really positive experience. And I think it was really all the feedback that we got uh, from folks, with, they were so glad to see the United uh, Front there between the City Council and the Chamber there to talk about our bond. So I think it was a, an effective strategy and I appreciate all of your help. Well, Mayor Hoy, I uh, come tonight to speak to City Council. First of all, to thank you all uh, as a council for putting together a package that was digestible, understandable, and certainly palatable for our voters and a full credit to Salem voters who said, we believe in the future trajectory of this city. And for our organization, uh, we are comprised of small businesses. Uh, do we have the smattering of big box stores that Jim uh, referenced? And Jim is, in full disclosure, director on our board. We do, but uh, almost 90% of our members are uh, fully what we would call small businesses. That is employing 20 or less employees who all happen to live and cash their paychecks in this city. And so we are very proud uh, to partner with those individuals and with this council to let the city know we believe in the future of this city and we are willing to invest as a community in infrastructure that will ensure economic prosperity and stability for many years to come. I'd like to, uh, there were a lot of thank yous given and I will not be repetitive. 
I know you have much to do, but I would like to point out a couple of individuals on the city staff who were in, in, absolutely instrumental in assisting us in having the right information. And that is Courtney Knox Bush and Josh Eaglesten. Josh and Courtney were tremendous helps. They were not allowed to advocate. And that is very strange how bond packaging works for municipalities. And so it was up to them to provide us clear, concise, and factual information that we could take to our educated voters in Salem. And the messaging proved very clear. Our community rallied and very significantly said, we believe in this city. Uh, it was an honor to partner with you, Mayor, as well as uh, City Council President Stapleton, uh, to work with Councillor Nishioka, to work with Councillor Phillips, and all of you councillors who believe deeply, like we do, that Salem is an incredible place to live and a place we want to see our future in. I would end with a note that this is about community collaboration, and we need to treat each other uh, very well uh, moving forward. We need to be the model for our kids and people watching on how campaigns are run and how adults and community volunteers interact. There will be differences of opinion on occasion in the city, but let's remember the great work that we've done together and the belief system we have that, that our, our community is stronger when we re, uh, you know, un, unite together rather than push each other apart. I think those are values we all hold and certainly our organization stands ready to partner with this council as it moves forward as we have with past councils but we are committed to a great Salem and our organization can't wait to see what we do with our holiday work uh, and Jim Vu's project with Main Street Association. Our name and dollars are behind it. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Tom. Appreciate it. Appreciate your kind words and your partnership. Absolutely. Are there any questions or comments for Tom? All right. Thank you so much for coming down or turning your, t your, your uh, monitor on. And with that, we are on to the consent calendar. Councilor Stapleton. Okay, I move approval of the consent calendar with the exception of item 3.3C pulled by Councilor Phillips. Second. Councilor. Thank you so much. Um, the consent calendar consists of quite a number of things. I will try and get it all straight here. Item 3.1A, the October 24th, 2022 draft city council minutes. Item 3.1B, the November 2nd, 2022 draft city council minutes. Item 3.2A, which is a modification of the department fees related to ambulance services. Uh, we have item 3.3B, a resolution adopting council policy C-18 post issuance compliance procedure policy. Item 3.3A, appointment of Michelle Villaking as a municipal uh, judge pro tem. And Michelle, I apologize if I got that wrong. I asked to Google, so I hope I got it right. Um, appointment, uh, sorry, item 3.3B, appointment of Sarah Williams as municipal judge pro tem. And item 3.3D, ratification of addendum to purchase and sale agreement with Discount Nursery Supply LLC for the sale of real property located at the Salem Business Campus. Item 3.3E, approve transit occupancy tax funding to pay city fees for a holiday parade and tree lighting. And that concludes our consent calendar. Thank you, Councillor. Is there any further discussion? Councillor Nordyke. Uh, thank you. I just wanted to say I will be wholeheartedly voting in favor of Ms. Williams and Ms. Watching for their roles as pro tempore. Uh, I'm familiar with both of these attorneys in town. Um, they have great reputations, good, good professional credentials, and they both have dedicated years of service to our community. So I have no doubt they'll make outstanding additions to the bench. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Any other discussion? The reporter will please call the roll. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm seeing. Councillor Leon. Thank you. Thank Councillor Leon. Um, thank you, Mayor Hoy. Uh, this is Councillor Leon. Um, um, like um, Councillor Nordyke, I, I'm also I'm really excited to um, about the appointment of, uh, of two judges. I am not familiar with um, Judge Williams, but for Michelle Valching, um, I've worked with uh, Michelle in a capacity years and years ago. So it's been a long time since I've um, 
talk to Michelle. So it's great to be able to see that uh, both of them are up for uh, pro tem opportunities as uh, judges for the city of safety. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. I apologize for not seeing you. All right. If the recorder will please call the roll. Councillor Leon. Aye. Councillor Gonzalez. Aye. Councillor Hoy. Aye. Councillor Nordyke. Aye. Councillor Varney. Aye. Councillor Stapleton. Aye. Councillor Nishioka. Aye. Councillor Phillips. Aye. Mayor Hoy. Aye. Motion passes. All right, we are now on to our first public hearing. The recorder will read the announcement. Sorry, I had to unmute. The Salem City Council will now conduct a public hearing to receive testimony regarding Ordinance Bill number 2322 relating to naming an unnamed connection between Rosewood Drive Northwest and Manor View Lane Northwest as West Side Circle Northwest. The criteria applicable to the proposal are set forth in SRC 255.010C6. Um, testimony arguments and evidence must be directed toward the applicable criteria or other criteria which the person believes to apply to the decision. Although no individuals signed up this evening, but we will begin with the hearing with the staff presentation. Thank you. Thank you. And I see Ms. Warnke has joined us. Uh, will you be doing the honors? Uh, yes. So yeah. good evening, uh, Mayor and City Councilors. My name is Julie Warnicke. I'm the Transportation Planning Manager with the Public Works Department. And I'd like to start by entering the staff report into the record. And then I want to share my screen. Sorry. Oh, it's the big green one right in the middle. That's tricky. Okay. Okay, can everybody see my screen? Yes. So uh, this is a uh, city initiated street name change. Uh, this came to city council. It's already been to city council a couple times, but initially it was brought by as a council resolution on September 26th that initiated the name change. Um, what we're talking about here is what's shown in red, which is um, the proposal is for this to be named West Side Circle. So back in about 2017, 2018, Capital Manor uh, did some reinvestment and expansion. And as part of that, they did a big reconfiguration um, in this area of, of their property. They consolidated lot lines, they vacated some streets. It used to be Paradise Court through there and they created the West Side Villas, which are what are shown here. These are considered, they were treated through the development process as multifamily development. And as I'm sure you're aware, we don't typically name um, drive aisles essentially uh, for multifamily developments. There have been some concern and confusion with emergency response um, to this area, primarily because all of these units starting with 2001 um, and going to 2067 have addresses on Salem Dallas Highway Northwest. So this building here is the Capitol Tower building. And then you have the uh, memory care and um, sorry, I'm not exactly sure of all their building names, but all three of these buildings have the address of 1900 Salem Dallas Highway with various suites, you know, lots and lots of different suites. These ones were 2001 Salem Dallas Highway. And so there was some confusion with first responders coming and not sh being sure if they were going to one of the suites located within this complex or to one of these separate units. So our fire department worked closely with Capital, Ma Capital Manor to come up with something that would work and that would also fit into city code. And our code does allow for the naming of connections between um, existing either public or private streets. So that is what is proposed here tonight. Um, I did see that there are a couple people submitted uh, testimony. I also did talk to some individuals. Uh, there's some just 
questions, concerns about the whole renaming process. And I wanted to assure city council that um, first of all, this was coordinated through the fire department. And so deputy chief Hadley in particular was very involved with this and they are supportive of it. Uh, secondly, we have a process for providing notice of the approval once it's approved, if it's approved to the US Postal Service, as well as um, emergency providers. We can also share this with Google Maps. And so those notices will go out after the second ordinance reading, and then 30 days after that when it's effective. Um, we, uh, Deputy Chief Hadley spoke with the Postal Service and was informed that once they have confirmation of a change, they will uh, continue to deliver to the old address for 18 months. So um, people, residents don't need to worry about, you know, having that, you know, new address in effect, you know, right away. The building, the, these, the big buildings, I guess I'll call them, are going to continue to be 1900 Salem Dallas Highway, and that works best for emergency service providers and also for Capital Manor. With that, I would be happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you, Ms. Warnicke. I, I can tell you, I don't have a question, but I can tell you I did have a constituent reach out to me who there was a real life um, example of why this has been problematic with the way they were addressing. They actually had their mail and it was actually a critical, it was medication that had been delivered to the wrong address because of the confusion just recently. So they were very excited to hear that this was coming up on our um up on our agenda so they can hopefully not have that mix up in the future. So are there yes. questions for Ms. Warnicke? Uh, Councillor Barney. Thank you. I had a question um, and thank you, uh, Ms. Warnicke for the uh, great explanation and kind of the history on it. You answered a number of my questions. Uh, one of the things I was wondering about is on the map, there's a west side loop indicated will that just kind of go away or does that apply to some other area that will go away that was the naming that the uh, capital manor had given to their you know essentially their own driveways but it was not an official address so okay. this will be be the west side circle and as you can see it's sort of mirrored over on this side with the manor view circle so it's right. a you know, sort of a balance and I also wanted to throw in there that, um, you know, getting things updated on Google Maps may take some time, but um, I did go and look a couple days ago and uh, Salem Parkway has had its name changed on those um, platforms to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Parkway. And so that didn't take too long. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions for staff? We have nobody signed up to uh, for public testimony. Just confirming one more time, there's no other questions. Uh, anything else, Ms. Warnicke, that we need to address before we close the hearing? Nope. Um, if this is approved tonight, it will come back to you, um, I believe, in two weeks for a second ordinance reading. And then once again, 30 days later would be effective and we will continue to coordinate closely with Capital Manor um, to make, get the word out. Great. I, they invited me to a dinner over there on Thursday. So I'm sure this will be a topic of conversation. So I'll let them know their progress. So thank you. And with that, I will close the public hearing and Councillor Stapleton, I'm sorry, Councillor Varney, do you have a motion? I do, thank you. I move that we approve naming an unnamed connection between Rosewood Drive Northwest and Manor View Lane Northwest as West Side Circle Northwest and proceed to second reading of ordinance bill number 23-22 for enactment. Second. It's been moved by Councilor Varney, seconded by Councilor, I'm not sure if it was Stapleton or Nordyke. Either one, Nordyke oh. sounds great. No, Councilor Nordyke then. Is there any further discussion? If the recorder will please call the roll. Councillor Gonzalez. Aye. Councillor Hoy. Aye. Councillor Nordyke. Aye. Councillor Varney. Aye. Councillor Stapleton. Aye. 
Councilor Nishioka? Aye. Councilor Phillips? Aye. Councilor Leung? Aye. Mayor Hoy? Aye. Motion passes. All right. On to item 4B, a public hearing regarding the annexation of territory located at 5536 Skyline Road South. The recorder, would you like to make the announcement? The Salem City Council will now conduct a public hearing to consider a petitioner initiated annexation of territory located at 5536 Skyline Road South with a concurrent comprehensive plan change to multifamily residential and zone change to RM1 multiple family residential one. The criteria applicable to the proposal are set forth in SRC 260.060C. Testimony, arguments, and evidence must be directed toward the applicable criteria or other criteria that which the person believes to apply to the decision. Failure to raise an issue prior to the close of the public hearing in person or in writing or failure to provide statements or evidence with sufficient specificity to provide the parties and the city council an opportunity to respond to the issue precludes appeal to the land use board of appeals on that issue a similar failure to raise constitutional issues relating to proposed conditions of approval precludes an action for damages in circuit court the hearing will begin with a staff presentation and followed by testimony from the applicant uh, the applicant has uh, 10 minutes and the in the applicant may have a rebuttal period if if needed thank you Thank you, Amy. And at this time, I would like to give an opportunity for any counselors that might need to declare any ex parte contact or any conflicts of interest on this issue. Seeing none, we will ask the staff then to uh, start the presentation. Ms. Olmstead. Okay, uh, good evening. I'm Liz Olmstead, planner with the Community Development Department. Tonight, I'm presenting the staff report for annexation case number ANXC 752 and concurrent comprehensive plan and zone change for the territory identified as 5536 Skyline Road South. I would like to enter the staff report attachments and tonight's presentation into the record. Um, here's a vicinity map showing the location of the subject property. Um, the subject property is located southeast of Skyline Road South and north of Davis Road South. The property is currently developed with a single family home. The subject property is designated developing residential and the surrounding properties are designated developing residential and single family residential. Uh, the subject property is owned in Marion County Urban Transition five acres. The properties to the north and south are designated residential agriculture, and the properties to the east are zoned urban transition five acres and single family residential, and the properties to the west are zoned urban transition five acres. Um, the applicant has requested a comprehensive plan designation of multifamily residential and a zoning of multifamily residential one or RM1. The planning commission recommended approval. Um, staff finds the proposed annexation met the annexation criteria, including whether it is consistent with the comprehensive plan and statewide planning goals, allows orderly, efficient, and timely provision of urban services, and serves the public interest. Um, this annexation is exempt from voter approval. And staff recommends that the City Council adopt order number 2022-16 ANX determining that the proposal meets the applicable criteria changes the comprehensive plan designation and zoning for the territory and approve withdrawal of the territory from the Salem Suburban Rural Fire Protection District. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you. If you could go ahead and stop sharing, we'll go on to the applicant. Thank you so much. And I would like to call up uh, Brittany Randall. You have 10 minutes. Thank you, Mayor Hoy, and thank you, Liz, for your presentation. Um, I will not be needing my 10 minutes, um, as Liz has provided you all with the facts. Um, I did want to say that the project will be adding um, 16 multifamily units um, and and these units will be coming online fairly quickly the property owner has engaged the city 
uh, with the pre-application conference already to move forward with development proposals. Um, so that's exciting uh, considering, uh, although we met our quota for lands, we still have a deficit of units. So 16 more units, that's great. Um, and then we um, are seeking RM1 as Liz has stated, so lower density to better match surrounding development. And I'm available to answer any questions that you might have. All right, thank you, Ms. Randall. Uh, let's see, I see that we have no neighborhood associations signed up, no interest party. Do we have any questions for Ms. Randall? All right, uh, do we have any questions for staff? All right, and Ms. Uh, Randall, this is an opportunity for any rebuttal. I know no, nothing was stated, so there's probably not any rebuttal, but anything else you wanted to share with us? Uh, no, I won't argue against myself, Mayor, thank you. Wise, very wise. All right, uh, let's see, Ms. Olmstead, are there any uh, procedural issues that we need still need to be addressed or are we ready to close this hearing? Um, no, Mayor. Thank you. I will close the public hearing and uh, look to Councillor Nordyke for a motion. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move that we adopt order number 2022-16, determining that the proposal meets the applicable criteria, apply city zoning for the territory, and approve withdrawal of the territory from the Salem Suburban Rural Fire Protection District. Second. Second by Councillor Phillips. Is there any discussion? All right, if the recorder will please call the roll. Councillor Hoy. Aye. Councillor Nordyke. Aye. Councillor Varney. Aye. Councillor Stapleton. Aye. Councillor Nishioka. Aye. Councillor Phillips. Aye. Councillor Leung. Aye. Councillor Gonzalez. Aye. Mayor Hoy. Aye. Motion passes. And I see that we still have two more public hearings. I would like to just pause for about a five minute break. So uh, let's just take a quick break and we'll be back in five minutes.
on CC Media to step for you. Too bad you can't show us pictures. <laughs> Still need one more counselor to turn their camera on for a quorum. Excellent. I'm back. Excellent. Thank you, Councilor Nordyke. All right. We are ready to resume. And with that, we are on item 4C, which is a public hearing regarding the 2022 Unified Development Code update. And I see Eunice Kim has joined us. I will turn it over to you. I'm sorry, I'll turn it over to the recorder first. Thank you. The Salem City Council will now conduct a public hearing uh, to consider proposed amendments to the Salem Revised Code updating the city's zoning and development code known as the Unified Development Code UDC. The amendments implement changes in state law, add new temporary uses, and address other issues that have recently arisen, including a decision from the Land Use Board of Appeals. The criteria applicable to the proposal are set forth in SRC 110.085, Testimony must be directed toward the identified criteria or other criteria the person believes to apply to the decision. The hearing will be conducted with the staff presentation first and no individual signed up to testify. Thank you. Thank you. And before we get started, I would like to provide an opportunity for any counselors who want to declare any conflict of interest. Councilor Nishioka. Thank you, Mayor Hoy. Yes, I do, <clears throat> I do need to declare uh, a potential conflict for item 4C22-501. I own a commercial property in uh, located in the area of the code update. Thank you, Counselor. Anybody else? All right, uh, Counselor Leon. I have a quick, quick, quick thing, sorry. No um, thank you, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, um, like uh, Counselor Nishioka, I would have to declare a potential conflict as well um, through my nonprofit because we do own the property and we are in the process of potentially purchasing additional property. Thank you, Counselor. Mr. Atchison, are we good to go? Yes, Mayor, you're good to go. Awesome. Thank you so much. With that, I will ask uh, Eunice Kim to give us her staff report. Great. Good evening, Mayor Hoy and City Councilor. I'm going to share my screen really quickly. Can everyone see that? Yes. Great. Um, so I'm Eunice Kim. I'm the Long Range Planning Manager for the City of Salem. I'm here tonight to present the staff report for Code Amendment Case 2205. I'd like to enter the staff report and the presentation into the record. The code amendment tonight makes a variety of changes to the unified development code known as the UDC. The city periodically updates the UDC. We do this to respond to changes in state laws and rules, um, to address new priorities that have come up in the community, and to really kind of address issues that have arisen as we, as we have applied the code um, in the community. We've done some major updates already this year. Uh, the first one was this spring when we implemented House Bill 2001. That was the middle housing law, as well as our tree preservation requirements that we increased. And then with the R Salem project adoption in July, we did update the code to add some new zones, eliminate some zones, and make some other changes. Tonight's um, update to the Unified Development Code largely responds to changes in state law and rules, but it also addressed the decision of the Land Use Board of Appeals, or LUBA. The Land Use Board of Appeals earlier this year issued an order reversing a decision in East Park for the City of Salem. Specifically, LUBA found that the city erred in denying a conditional use permit for multifamily housing in the commercial retail zone, the CR zone. State law requires that the city only apply clear and objective standards and procedures to the development of housing. A conditional use permit, however, process includes a public hearing and the decision-making process includes discretion. 
So for example, the criteria for a conditional use permit includes things around compatibility um, to the surrounding neighborhood. So it is not a clear and objective process. Luba therefore issued a reversal. Uh, earlier this year, the city council did approve that conditional use permit in response to that Luba decision um, for that project. So while the East Park issue has been resolved, we have to address the broader issue of a conditional use requirement for housing. <clears throat> so we're doing that tonight in this proposal. There are three zones in the city where we are requiring currently a conditional use permit for multifamily housing. Um, that's done in the commercial retail zone, the commercial general zone, and the industrial commercial zone. These three zones are largely located in our employment areas across the city. So for example, you'll find these zones in the Fairview Industrial Area, along Mission Street, between Portland Road and the Parkway, and along 12th and 13th Street. So tonight, the code member before you proposes to address this issue of the conditional use permit by removing the conditional use requirement for multifamily housing in these three zones and instead allow multifamily housing outright if it is part of a mixed use building. We define a mixed use building in Salem as something that's very specific. It has to be at least two stories. You have to have a non-residential use on the bottom floor and residential uses above. Um, this fix removes any discretion in the approval process for multifamily housing, which addresses the LUBA issue. And it also preserves, preserves our employment land. So if you remember during the R Salem project, we did convert a lot of our commercial land to mixed use. Um, our mixed use zones do allow multifamily housing outright. And, um, and we wanted to promote multifamily housing primarily along um, our frequent transit routes. So we did some conversions along Commercial Street, Lancaster, um, and other areas. The remaining areas that we didn't convert through the R Salem project are areas where we have commercial and industrial properties. And again, they're in our employment centers. So the, another thing that this code amendment does is implements Senate Bill 8. Um, this was passed in the 2021 legislative session, and it essentially allows affordable housing outright in any zone except the general industrial zone. So the law really trumps our zoning code. So if the city were to prohibit standalone multifamily in our commercial zones, for example, like the code amendment is proposing, if a developer wanted to build affordable multifamily housing, they could still do that outright without a zone change, without a conditional use permit. That housing would have to be affordable for 30 years. Um, and there's very strict definitions in terms of what affordable is. Um, and we could still apply our design and development standards. So this is really trying to promote affordable housing across the city, regardless of the zone. In addition, um, the code amendment is implementing House Bill 4064, which is from our 2022 legislative session. This law essentially prohibits cities from applying any extra standards to manufactured homes that we don't apply to single family homes. So again, it's trying to make it easier for multifamily er, manufactured homes um, to be developed in the city. So this amendment would remove the standards that we have currently in our code that really kind of dictate what a manufactured home has to look like. That law is already in effect. In addition, uh, this code amendment codifies the city's existing car camping program. So the car camping program that we have today um, was really authorized under an emergency declaration. Through this process, uh, the car camping pro program can continue without an emergency declaration. Um, a property owner developer could apply for a temporary use permit to have a car camping program as long as they met all of these standards. So just like our existing car camping program, there are restrictions in terms of number of vehicles, um, you know, hand washing facilities, hours of operation, et cetera. And last but not least, this code amendment starts to implement the rules that came out of the climate friendly and equitable communities rulemaking. Those were rules that were adopted by the Land uh, Conservation and Development Condition, uh, Commission at the state in July. And it really aims to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by making changes to our land use and transportation systems. So the first thing that we're doing is trying to implement their rules around electric vehicle charging capacity. So this amendment would apply to multifamily and mixed use buildings and require that these developments 
um, provide the capacity, so the conduit, to have to support future electric vehicle charging stations. It doesn't actually require those stations to be placed. So it's getting ready. So in the future, if there's um, a want a desire to do this, that those um, that conduit is already there. In addition, um, the climate friendly and equitable rules community communities rules um, require that we eliminate parking requirements in certain areas and for certain uses. So the first thing it does, it says within a half a mile of any 15 minute bus service, we cannot require minimum parking requirements. Parking can still be um, provided. It's not saying you can't provide it, but we as a city cannot require it. 15 minute bus service, which this map shows, is a little different than the core network that we really planned around during the R Salem project, but there is a lot of overlap. And in addition, there are some uses citywide that we can no longer require parking for like affordable housing, shelters, and small units. So all of this kicks in um, at the start of next year, whether or not we codify it, but we wanna put it in our code so that it's really transparent. So when people are looking to do development, um, they can look to our code as opposed to having to weed through OARs and um, state law. We did receive some public comments um, on this code amendment. Two comments were in support, particularly to those changes to minimum parking requirements. One comment was in opposition to the parking requirements being changed, and the Land Use Committee for SCAN submitted a comment stating no concerns. The staff recommends engrossing ordinance number 2222 and advancing it to second reading. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Eunice, for that very uh, clear uh, report. I appreciate it. Uh, are there any questions for Eunice? Uh, Councilor Phillips. Yes, uh, thank you, Eunice, for the overview. And my apologies for not being able to meet uh, offline and prior to this. I know you guys tried. Uh, my schedule's been a little chaotic in the last month and a half. Um, so uh, it sounds like uh, there's a lot to like in the recommendations for this, the UDC updates discussed here. Um, and I think you alluded to something that's already settled but might be touched on in this which is uh, the East Park um, decision that we made earlier as council. And um, not to relitigate you know, what, what has already you know, got a solution, but I remember broadly speaking, we and staff had some concerns about you know, having housing next to like a gas station. So you know, it seems like in this, we, we are doing what we have to, to be in line with the state um, legislative, uh, le sorry, the state laws that have changed through the state legislature. Um, and it seems like there's still some attempt to like maintain some local uh, input where possible, uh, like, a, like a compromise uh, of having the, the mixed use uh, on the second floor and up. Uh, I mean, is, am I wrong? I, I'm trying to summarize my understanding of this on a, on a broad 30,000 foot level, but is, is that a correct kind of read of what we're doing tonight or am I missing something? Yes, you have that correct. Okay. Um, because we are requiring housing um, at, w with the non-residential and that mixed use building like you were talking about, we're unlikely to get you know a gas station with housing on, on top. And we're addressing the LUBA issue of having clear and objective standards, not having that discretion in the conditional use process. And then a follow-up question, if I may. Um, is it different though when there is affordable housing? Is that not require the mixed use? Yes, that's correct. Affordable housing can be standalone multifamily in any zone really except for our industrial general zone. And that was a state law as well. Correct. So that and, and I, I just want to make sure I, and I do understand it correctly. So in that situation, is it possible that we could end up in a situation where we have multifamily housing near like a gas station? Not that I mean, it, that seems less than ideal, but I, I guess I'm just have we do we just have to accept that we've lost some local control? And could that still happen? Or, or is there some way that we could still have local input and avoid things that we think are not ideal? Um, yes, I think technically that could still occur where someone does affordable housing, but the zone, the underlying zone does allow, for example, a gas station. It's probably unlikely, but you're correct in that that could still potentially happen. Thank you. And this is my final thing on this. Um, 
So st- I think staff have done a good job. I think this is a good product. I, I probably will ultimately be supportive of it. Um, but I, I do just want to take a comment that it is a. it seems like this could be, for lack of a better expression, an unintended consequence of you know the attempt to deal with the housing crisis here in Oregon. So I mean, you know, this is a newer uh, state legislative change, um, and I just I, I think it's it's admirable that we're all trying and and the various levels of government to try to make an impact on this crisis. But you know, we I just want to reserve the right to moving forward communicate to our state delegation that we may want to make some nominal changes around the edges so as to avoid situations where we you know may have something similar to a lot of housing right next to a gas station. That's it. Thank, Thank you. you. Counselor. Thank you. Councilor Leon. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Councilor Leon, um, I also echo uh, Councilor Phillips in expressing um, apologies for not being able to arrange a time to meet with you in advance, uh, Ms. Kim. I, I know we would try to schedule a few times and illness and a few other things that kind of uh, pushed everything aside. Um, so I also agree with uh, Councillor Phillips um, in terms of uh, some concerns and how it might impact some affordable housing, but at the same time, how much it opens up uh, potential affordable housing projects. And I, I wanted to kind of go back on one of the slides that you had uh, brought up. It was specifically the, the e-vehicle stations. Um, so it was a designated 40% of parking, if parking is provided, that would be eventually set up for an e E um, charging stations, if um, e charging stations are put up, but otherwise, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be putting up the e charging stations. That is correct. Okay, and so that means like even though it may be listed as reserved eventually for e charging stations, uh, people who like may may have a vehicle could potentially still park there until an actual e charging station is set up. That is correct. Thank you. Did it. Thank you, Councillor. Are there any other questions? Ms. Kim, did you have any further comments for us? No, I did not. All right. Anything else we need to address before we close the hearing? Ms. Kim? Great. We'll close the public hearing then, and I will look to Councillor Stapleton for a motion. Great. Thank you. Yeah, I move to engross ordinance number uh, 22-22 and advance it to second reading for the purpose of amending the Unified Development Code to respond to the Land Use Board of Appeals decision, implement changes in state law and rules, new add new temporary uses, and address other issues. It's quite the sentence. Seconded by Councilor Phillips. Is there any further discussion? All right, if the recorder will please call the roll. Councillor Nordyke. Aye. Councillor Barney. Aye. Councillor Stapleton. Aye. Mm. Councillor Nishioka. Aye. Councillor Phillips. Aye. Councillor Leung. Aye. Councillor Gonzalez. Aye. Councillor Hoy. Aye. Mayor Hoy. Aye. Motion passes. All right. On to item 4D, if the recorder will announce the hearing. The Salem City Council, excuse me, Salem City Council will now conduct public hearing for the purpose of considering a petitioner initiated vacation to vacate Cross Street Southeast, west of 20th Street Southeast. The owner of the neighboring property wishes to incorporate the area to be vacated into the surrounding automobile dealership. The criteria applicable to the proposal are set forth in SRC 255.065B6. Testimony must be directed toward the identified criteria or other criteria the person believes to apply to the decision. Failure to raise an issue to the close prior to the close of the public hearing in person or in writing or failure to provide statements or evidence with sufficient specificity to provide the parties and the city council an opportunity to respond to the issue precludes appeal to the land use board of appeals on that issue. A similar failure to raise constitutional issues relating to proposed conditions of approval precludes action for damages in circuit court. 
The hearing will begin with a staff presentation, followed by a testimony from the following. Um, it's actually the applicant's representative and the applicant are both signed up. So they will share a combined time of 10 minutes. And then I guess if they want to rebut anything, uh, they would have five minutes at the end. Thank you. Thank you. And at this time, I'd like to take a pause for any counselors who might like to declare any ex parte contact or conflicts of interest. Seeing none, uh, I see we have Mr. Gamalo here with us. I'll turn it over to you for your presentation. Thank you. Uh, good evening. My name is Anthony Gamalo. I'm a senior transportation planner in the Public Works Department, and I would like to enter this staff report into the record. Uh, the subject property is located in Ward 2 in the Southeast Salem uh, Neighborhood Association. And like the recorder said, the petitioner seeks to vacate a section of Cross Street Southeast west of 20th Street Southeast uh, to allow for the neighboring, um, neighboring Hyundai dealership uh, to use the right of way uh, for secured parking and storage of vehicles. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my screen right now. Okay. Is that visible? Okay. Yes. Um, great. Thank you. <clears throat> so this is going to be an unusual situation um, because uh, staff is recommending that council deny the proposed vacation. Uh, the reason for the re recommendation is that the vacation would prevent any future potential connection of Cross Street to the west um, from 20th uh, to 18th Streets. And um, the reason that's important is you can see, uh, so this is the area to be vacated here, highlighted in red. Um, there are no connections to the west from 20th uh, at the streets to the south. So yeah, there's Wilbur, Howard, and Lewis uh, going all the way to Oxford. That's the next connection going uh, west um, to 14th here. So you, you have this kind of super block condition that's existing now. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, we feel that Cross Street would represent the uh, best alternative for a potential connection uh, from 20th uh, across um, to the, this area here, which is all, uh, this is residential. Um, uh, because uh, it, it's the best alternative compared to these streets here um, it's the shortest potential connection down the road, and uh, there are no uh, existing buildings in the way. <clears throat> um, the staff report that you all have uh, outlines the numerous city policies that we have related uh, to street connectivity um, with the intent of encouraging uh, bicycle and pedestrian connections. And uh, staff feels this vacation uh, would forever ensure the existence of this a uh, super block condition between uh, Mission, Oxford, 20th and 14th. Um, uh, that, and that, that super block contradicts uh, the, the connectivity policies uh, that we have outlined uh, in our transportation system plan and our um, uh, unified development code. Uh, so um, it is for that reason that we are recommending denial um is uh, primarily for connectivity issues uh related to a potential down the road uh pedestrian and uh or a connection here that would facilitate uh bike and pedestrian uh movement through this area so i'm going to go ahead and uh, stop sharing and uh that's the uh end of my brief presentation and i'm happy to take any questions that you might have thank you thank you Thank you, Mr. Gamalo. Are there any questions uh, for staff before we hear from the applicant? Councilor Stapleton. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I just wanted to have a quick question here for you. Um, one of the things that I was thinking as I read through this was, you know, is there some way that we can lease this land to them until we have, you know, um, future plans, knowing that we have our transportation master plan update coming up? Um, I definitely wasn't, you know, feeling like we should just uh, get rid of something without having that big planning uh, done. Um, but then I read that we have offered that and uh, that is not an option that they're interested in. Is that correct? That's correct. Uh, we offered a um, 
sort of a, a right of way use license um, that um, would allow uh, the the applicant to um, to use the right of way until such time uh, that it would be needed for uh, either street purposes or until such time that the adjoining properties would redevelop uh, and install a street improvement as part of that redevelopment. Great, and I just had a, a little follow up here, if it's all right, Mayor. Sure. Um, yeah, I, I understand. I, I was a little frustrated because I think, um, you know, we all want all of these big transportation plans to be enacted and built. Um, but having spent two years on the council, I realized that some of these plans are decades in the future, right? So I'm making this connection could be decades uh, in the future. Um, and so it, there could be a use there. If this um, denial does go through, is there any way that they can reconsider that option with staff to lease it? Um, yes, I believe they could, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor, Councillor Nishioka. Uh, thank you, Mayor Hoy, and <clears throat> thank you, Councillor Stapleton, because those were exactly the same questions I was going to ask. And to reassure um, all of us and the Hyundai ownership that they could reapply, um, if this is denied, they could reapply for that right of way license to use until uh, the street is further extended, as uh, Councillor Stapleton said, it might be some time. I just want reassurance on that. Yes, they could. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor. And if, if there aren't any questions, more questions at this time, we will go to the applicant for their presentation. We have Mr. Mark Shipman and Mr. David with Nell here. You have a combined 10 minutes. Go ahead. Uh, good evening, Mr. Mayor and members of the council. For the record, Mark Shipman, land use attorney with Southfield Griggs, 250 Church Street, Southeast, Suite 200, Salem, Oregon, 97301. Here this evening on behalf of Do Investments, uh, LLC, the property owner in this application. Uh, Mayor, I will. I want to confirm that I will be the only person presenting tonight. Uh, Mr. Withnell could not make uh, tonight's hearing. All right, Mr. and you have 10 minutes on your own. Great. I'm not going to take it all. So, frankly, there's three reasons why you should approve this request. Uh, first, we satisfy the approval criteria. Uh, there is a public benefit, and this is a mutually beneficial application for both DO and the city. Uh, first, I want to speak to the satisfaction of the approval criteria. And I'm, I'm looking at this request and approval through the lens of a half full glass. Okay. And I think that I'm looking at this very positively, very similarly to how folks looked at the streets and bridges bond. Staff feels that vacating this right of way will prohibit uh, future local street connectivity as, as they, and they provide that, uh, that uh, illustration that uh, Mr. Gamalo showed you in his presentation. And really, I think the question that, that we all need to ask is, how much connectivity do we need at any given point, and especially at this particular location? It's true, if, if you kept Cross Street as a city right-of-way, it would it'd be a good goal if you're actually going to move forward. And this goes to uh, uh, Councillor Stapleton's uh, comments. Um, and if you're able to connect that missing link. But the reality is, is the city hasn't done this for more than 45 years. And in fact, they've not done this for, I would, I would say, since since that development was developed to the west of this property in the 1930s, 1940s. So there's this gap that's there between the existing cross street right of way and, um, and the street to the west that Mr. Gamala talked about. It's over 425 feet in length. Um, the city had the opportunity to expand cross street right of way um, in 1978 when uh, the MAPS office building was built there, uh, which is now owned by the Curly Commercial on Hind Street, uh, immediately to the west of the of the Dew property. But the city didn't request it. They didn't expand the right of way. They could have. Then in 1996, when Dick and Gail with Nell developed the Hyundai dealership on their property, the city also had the opportunity to acquire that right of way. On the Withnell property, and they they did not uh, they did not do that at that point either. Then again, in in 2021, when David and Laura Withnell added on significant renovations to the Hyundai dealership, City Public Works could have asked for the, and and negotiated for that right of way through the property, and they didn't do it then. So over the course of more than 45 years, the city of Salem has had several opportunities to acquire this right-of-way for Cross Street, for that Cross Street gap, 
but it's not acted in a manner that suggests they feel that local connectivity in this area is that important. Otherwise, they would have pursued it. It would have been way more economical in 1978 and, and in the 19, early 1990s before the significant development occurred on the Curly commercial property and on the, on the Dew property with the Hyundai dealership. If you did it now, you're going to have a substantial impact. I mean, this gets back to, to uh, uh, Commissioner Stapleton's comments and Commissioner Councillor Nishioka's comments. If you did it now, you would you would substantially affect the Curly commercial property. It would it would eliminate the drive through on that property. It would also is severely impact their parking and their parking ratios for that commercial office building. Likewise, with the Duke property, the Hyundai dealership, you're going to, you would be cutting through that commercial auto dealership with a public street driving right right through the middle of the dealership and that would be that would have um uh adverse impact on their operation as well so this again i go back to the connectivity question and and for i wish that anthony had a, a good aerial photograph that we could that we could take a look at because what i would show you is that if you looked at aerial photographs on the due property you'll find that there's new sidewalks new intersection ramps that provide residents ample pedestrian connectivity to Hind Street, Mission Street, and 20th Streets. Connecting Cross Street doesn't provide better connectivity to the Hines, Mission, or 20th Streets in this area. In fact, what it would rather do is it would, it would provide a cut through for those neighbors to avoid going on Hines Street. They would cut through on Cross Street to hit 20th and then head south or head north to go right on Mission Street. And living on a street in South Salem that actually has become a cut through, it's not pleasant to live on, and it's 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 actually can be dangerous. Next, uh, staff's emphasis on the block link, I think, is misplaced in this area. And Anthony did a good job as far as pointing out, I think, why it's misplaced. Because you look at the constraints that we have out there, you've got physical constraints, you also have use constraints. The physical constraints are Mission Street to the north, and the use constraints are the industrial commercial uses on those large parcels to the southwest and, and to the west. And the lack of uh, vehicular east-west crossings. And the key in this area is that there's no really good east-west crossings across the Union Pacific Railroad tracks. That's the that's the sticking point here. And the reality is, is that we're not going to get that. We're not going to get that in our lifetimes. We may not get that in our kids' lifetimes because UPR does not allow for additional railroad crossings. So we have limited crossings in this area, and that's really the hindrance to connectivity, frankly. So vacating the small portion of Cross Street is not going to have a significant impact or effect on the block lengths of this area or on the neighbor's ability to access Hines, Mission, or 20th Streets. And I realize that staff is really focused on the 600 feet as being the ultimate limit a block should be. However, the comprehensive plan actually provides for policies that have alternative language for situations like this. And that's what I'd like you to focus on. So where there are other factors or constraints, and they, use the, they use the term the adjacent layout, which can and should justify a larger block length. We're talking about, um, that's what we're looking at here. And we're not talking about a significant deviation. We're only talking about, in this case, uh, uh, at least 15% with respect to just looking at this area. I'm not looking further south to Oxford or, or uh, as Mr. Gamalo did. We're not actually proposing or seeking to create a super block in this case. We're just asking to be able to take a uh, a right of way that's not been maintained, that's not really used, and that is that our property is surrounding um, uh, on uh, on three sides. Rather than focusing on the 600 foot number, I think that staff and all of us could be looking at the alternative language for the for the adjacent layout, which justifies the larger block length. In this case, I'm not advocating for larger blocks in all cases. But I'm advocating for it in this case based on those very large industrial commercial uses that we have to the west and the southwest of this property. So I believe that that's how we can satisfy the criteria in this case. So next, what are the public benefits here that we're looking at? And there's several. First, Cross Street will actually be maintained and brought up to better condition than it has been uh, at no cost to the city or public. The portion of Cross Street will be landscaped and upgraded as a part of the Withnell Hyundai Auto Dealership, which will enhance the look and feel of this, this portion of 20th Street in the neighborhood. And then Cross Street is going to go on the tax rolls, uh, <clears throat> and that will be a contributing property to the tax rolls, which is also a public benefit. And then finally, 
This is a mutually beneficial application. And what I mean by that is that there's an additional benefit that staff hasn't brought up in this case, and that I think is a highly relevant. You see, the city has a 15 inch sewer main line that runs through the rest of the due property that does not have any easement. The city has no easement to have their sewer line on the due property. And so when this was done in the in the 1950s, we believe that there was a there was a mistake as no easement was granted. And we believe that this is the opportunity to correct that omission. And as a part of this process, we can correct it at no cost to the city. So there's a benefit to do in getting that additional right away on Cross Street. Then the benefit to the city is they get an easement through the due property for their existing sewer line at no cost to the city. That provides an unanticipated benefit both to the city and the residents as well. So in conclusion, the question really before you is, is you know, do we want to allow a local business to acquire property that um, hasn't been maintained and use it for productive use, uh, benefit the local businesses, the neighborhood and the public, or do you want to adhere to the status quo and do nothing for another 45 or 75 years? I, and I hope that doesn't come across as harsh or brash, but the reality is if you go with public works recommendation, connectivity is a good aspirational goal. But if you, but it's only if your aspirational goal is going to be followed up with present or realistic future actions. And in this case, staffs acknowledge that, and their past history has acknowledged that it's not going to happen. So if you go with our request, you gain more uh, than doing nothing or hoping that something will change in the future. And I would recommend that in this case, it could be a close decision, but I respectfully request that you approve it as we've laid out for you. Thank you for your consideration. I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Shipman. I have a couple of questions for you. One is, why did you not take up the city on their offer to let, just let you use this indefinitely until the city might actually need it? I'm just curious what the thought process was there. Well, I think the thought process there is, um, is that uh, David Withnell, um, who's the uh, one of the primary principals in Duke, uh, we had the conversation and and I, and I presented it to him and, and just said, look, you know, this is this is what the city's coming back with, and he just said no. He just said that's like that's like getting a, a revocable license, and that's my term, not his. But the reality is, is that it could be pulled out at any time, and and I realized that the facts don't necessarily bear that out to the west of what we're talking about. But David would prefer that it would be it, he would own it rather than than having the um, uh, something less than that with the city. Thank you. Are there other questions for the applicant, uh, Councilor Stapleton? Thank you. Um, thank you so much for your uh, coming down here and sharing this with us. Um, uh, just a quick question for you: If uh, you do acquire this property and do develop it. Would there be any consideration given to possibly um, some pedestrian or bike uh, connectivity uh, through the property that you own, um, you know, from 20th Street to the residential area over on Cross that's that's behind there? Would that be something that uh, the Withnell family would be interested in, in doing and, in, you know, for the future of, of connectivity as far as walkable walkability and, and biking is concerned for these folks? Uh Councilor Stapleton, I think that's a great question. I, I think that's tough from a design standpoint, if you think about it, because if you look at the, the ownership maps of the due property, their property goes all the way south past Wilbur. So they've got a, a, a very, very long, um, almost like a flagpole type type of property. Um, and they, they don't own all the land on 20th. They do own quite a bit of land um, past Cross Street, but not all the land down to Wilbur um, fronting on, on 20th Street. And I just think from a design standpoint, if you if you had like fencing or, or some sort of path in there, you know, part of this process is to secure the lot, is to keep is to keep that that parking lot secure um, from vandalism and, and from folks that might think it's a great idea to, to bust windows or graffiti cars or, or, or do something like that. And I just I just don't see how you could design it. If there was a way that if public work staff had a had an idea or a way that we could do that, then then I know that with Nell family would be would be open to considering that. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Nishioka. Uh, yes, thank you, Mayor Hoy. Um, so, Mr. Shipman, uh, if and maybe this is actually more of a legal question, so I'll make this more broad. Um, 
in the sense that uh, Mr. Atkinson may want to pipe in as well. Um, if we made the proposal to deny this, allowing you the, to have uh, with Nell make um, a, a request to go ahead with the right of way for use, if let's say in five years, nothing is getting done, the transportation master plan isn't moving forward with cross street being um, completed, could you then move forward with the request again? I'm just wondering if you had a right of way for a certain length of time, would could this request be asked again? I think it could be asked again. I'm not quite sure how we could bind a future council um, if, for example, we had a trigger date of five years, and that that meant that automatically there was a the that the the due um, uh, uh, company would be able to acquire Cross Street. Uh, we'd have to go through another process. You know, some of you may still be on council at that point, um, but there'd be likely um, you know, and maybe Mayor Hoy is still there. Um, but it's likely you'd have turnover. And, and Dan, I'll, I'll turn it to you to say, I, I don't know if we can if we can bind a future council in that way. Yeah, Dan Atchison, City Attorney, I, I didn't take the councilor's question to say that they would you know, have a conditional denial that it would be approved in five years. I just think she was asking whether the applicant could reapply. And yes, the applicant could. Thank you. Are we able to go to questions of staff now during this time of questions for the applicant, or do we need to wait? Yeah, um, council can. You can also, um, uh, you know, after he's done testifying, you can ask questions of staff and have an opportunity for rebuttal. Thank you, uh, Mr. Gamalo. I was curious um, about the information that Mr. Shipman shared about the lack of easement for our what was it I think a water line or a sewer line? I can't remember. Sewer. Yeah. Is that is that a real issue, and is that something that we need to resolve? Um, it is an issue to have a sewer um, with with no easement. Um, I see Peter is uh, unmuting, so he, I'll defer to him. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Thank Mr. you, Anthony. Peter Fernandez, Public Works Director. Uh, Mayor, it is certainly an issue. Uh, we do have these kinds of situations uh, in in a number of places where. Pipes were installed uh, over the years. Mr. Shipman talked about the pipe having been installed in the 50s with no easement. It is an issue that we would like to resolve. Uh, uh, we did not put it in the staff report because it really, at this point, has no, because we're recommending denial and had no bearing. Uh, if the council were to uh, 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 want, uh, 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 vote to approve, then we would want to bring that back as, uh, as part of the uh, of the conditions for for approval. Uh, thank you, Mr. Fernandez. So, what I heard you said say, if I just make sure I'm correct in here, you would like us to resolve that issue if it's possible within within the scope of this hearing. Is that correct? Uh, only if you uh, only if you if the council chooses to uh, uh, to vote for approval. If if the council sticks with the staff recommendation, then this is an issue that we'll have to resolve with the uh, with the property owners at. Uh, you know, under different auspices and, and frankly would be, you know, acquiring the, as Mr. Shipman indicates, acquiring the right of way, uh, the easement, not, not the right of way, the easement from them to, uh, to uh, uh, legalize that pipe being uh, running through their property. Thank you. Councilor Stapleton. Thank you so much. Um, I just pulled up the, the Google map and I just was looking at this while uh, Mr. Shipman was talking. If I could just caution you for one second. It's really important that we consider the evidence that we're being presented and that we don't do our own research during a public hearing. So I apologize. Uh, you might ask staff for that or ask somebody if, and please correct me if I'm mistaken, Mr. Atchison. I, I would just ask for uh, uh, Councillor Stapleton to, to send a copy of that link to staff so we can include it into the record. It's important we'll to get out. Thank you. It's just important that we all, everybody is aware of the information that we're considering before we make one of these decisions. I apologize. Um, I will uh, send this over. Um, could staff pull up the map that we were looking at before? Uh, sure. Just give me one moment. Um, and actually, as a matter of fact, I probably have a better one with better resolution. Um, just give me one second. 
Thank you. Yeah, I was having a hard time picturing everything that uh, Mr. Shipman was saying, and I so the better resolution would be great. Okay. Um, do you all see that okay? Yes. Okay, so I don't have uh, streets. Let me. Okay. There we go. Okay, you should see the names. Yes. That's Cross Street right there. That's 20th. Yeah. Great. Um, so I was looking um, to the west. So I see the little chunk over there that looks, um, uh, I guess, undeveloped. Um, that connects to 20th, right? And that's the little chunk, sorry, on the east um, that we're talking about, correct? Yes. And then it would go through this parking lot that's there? Yes. And Okay. And then this that section right there on the east where the trees are planted, that, yeah, um, sorry, here. yes. Um, so that has been somewhat developed by somebody. Um, did they buy the land from us or is, or would we need to buy that in future to connect the street? We, we would have to acquire that. That is owned privately. Okay. And, um, I, I guess since I am going to be sending this Google screenshot with my apologies to staff. Or, or, or I'm sorry, Councilor Stapleton, we'd have to acquire it or um uh provide some sort of easement um yeah but something would have to be done there yes okay thank you um so um the google shot that i am looking at that i will send with apologies um has to what looks like a building on it and so i guess that was one of my reasons that i was really confused um but maybe the building uh is no longer there and what you are looking at and showing us right now is the most current shot of the it land. is yeah th okay. this is a 2022 aerial okay Perfect. Thank you so much. That answers my question. You're welcome. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Phillips. Would you like, I'm sorry, would you like me to continue sharing this? Councilor, is it helpful for you or not? Um, it is Councilor helpful. Councilor Nishioka is saying yes, continue. So go ahead. Okay. So just let me know because I can't see you all. <laughs> Great. No problem. Councilor sure. Phillips. Yeah, mostly uh, I just wanted to uh, Thank you, Mayor Hoy, um, and, and thank you, everybody, on this public hearing. And I just wanted uh, City Council President Virginia Stapleton to know that she wasn't the only person on Google Maps. I did not mean to add additional facts to this testimony. I mean, I think it's the third document that is pretty far blown out, um, and I wasn't attempting to add my own facts to that. I was just trying to get a sense, like, you know, where in Salem this is and remind myself what's nearby. So I, too, will be sending a link to Google Maps, I guess. Um, but uh, so the, the 450 feet um, of undeveloped uh, road that would theoretically connect cross street to cross street uh, cuts across um, the, the property that's trying to acquire this and then the other property that's got the building on it. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So, I mean, it, thank you for answering that question. I guess just to I I hear staff's concerns. I hear the concerns of the or the the, the opinion of, of the applicant, and I get it. It's tough to balance this on the eve of what will be our transportation system plan update. I mean, I think that it's an understandable opinion for the applicant to have that you know nothing has been done for decades, but there's there's something right around the corner that could impact this. Um, so I it's hard to you know balance uh, the the applicant and our our you know our local. Uh, property owners, you know, desires with the greater community good. Um, and, you know, I, I hear staff's concerns. Um, I guess, like, to ask an impossible question, Anthony, is this like a close call or is this pretty clear from the perspective of staff, if that's possible to answer? Um, I, I suppose it's, uh, yeah, we're charged with interpreting the, the, uh, the policies and goals and objectives of, of the TSP and the Uni Unified Development Code. Um, I would say I, I believe that we are interpreting them correctly. Are the, is it open to interpretation? I, yes. Um, I, I think uh, Mr. Shipman you know, made his, his thoughts uh, uh, very clear and eloquently. Um, so it, I think it is open to interpretation. Um, but uh, I do, uh, I do support the the, the way we uh, at staff are seeing it. So, so as a follow-up, 
Counselor, if you could hold on for one second. I did see Mr. Uh, Staley want to interject. So I'd like to go to him okay. really briefly and then we'll come back to the both of you. I think okay. he might have some relevant thoughts here. Yeah, thank, thank, thank you, Mayor Hoy. Just in response to Councilor Phillips' question, uh, no, uh, there certainly is room for Council to decide what direction you want to go. This is a policy question for you all. It certainly seems as if the applicant's uh, proposal to provide us with an easement gives us something that we're looking for. Uh, and I was unaware of that proposal. I was also unaware when I was looking at the staff report that the adjoining property was developed and that there wasn't an easement or right of way connecting there. Uh, so again, I think with the easement uh, and with the uh, the other considerations here uh, that we've learned in this testimony, uh, there certainly is room for council to to move in a different direction than was proposed for you. Um, obviously, this particular street is not integral to our transportation system plan. There isn't a major crosstown connector here that we're looking at. This is this is breaking up a block in in one neighborhood. So. Uh, again, I think council has all the discretion here that you choose to use, and no, there isn't a concern from staff perspective if you choose to go in that direction. Thank you, Mr. Staley. And I'm just, as I learn your communication style and learn to interpret what I'm hearing you say, and please correct me if I'm wrong, you think that we ought to continue this public hearing, let staff go back and do some additional work, perhaps to... Um, resolve this whole easement issue and then come back to us at a later date with maybe some new information regarding that. I certainly would like to see some sort of universal resolution to this this whole situation, if possible, assuming that the rest of the council is amenable to to that. But I, I, I would like to to get that whole easement situation resolved if possible here. Is that, am I hearing you correctly? I think that's a great approach, Mayor. Uh, uh, we could table this discussion and come back uh, on the 28th and hopefully by then we could come to a resolution with the applicant about how to move forward with this uh, together as opposed to uh, with a recommendation of denial. Thank you, Mr. Staley. We'll go back to counselor questions then to see where this leads, but that's that's what I'm hearing at this point. I think we were with counselor Phillips and uh, you had questions or comments. I, I mean, I think that um, you, uh, Mayor Hoy and, and Manager Steely, uh, have, have essentially gotten to even ahead of where I was going. And, and Mayor, I, I couldn't have said, stated it better. I agree with what you just said. If I could second it as a motion, I would. But I guess my follow-up question is, do we need to kind of conclude? I mean, could we also close the public hearing, but like keep the record open and still get the same, you know, if we as counselors have questions for staff, would that be another way to go about doing it as well? And then I guess the question to the applicant would be, are they amenable to that? I mean, it, yeah, I hope they are. <laughs> so that's it. I'm, I'm Thank good. you, Counselor, Counselor Nishioka. Uh, yes, uh, Mayor Hoy, thank you. And uh, Mr. Staley, thank you again for your comments. My question was going to be, could we table this and have city review it again and work with the dealership to see if there's um, some way to bridge the gap and bring this to us at another time so that we can have um, a little more clarity on our motion. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Stapleton. Uh, yeah, I agree with everybody here. I think there's enough questions here um, to warrant um, pausing this for a little bit until we get more information. Um, two things that I would like staff to do in that time frame is um, I, I am wondering if there is, I understand the complications of the reasons why they want to do this for security, but also um, is there a way that we could look at a design option for some connectivity for the folks who are walking and biking from that neighborhood um, or even if it's wanted, um, I guess that is my next question is, have we heard from the neighborhood association? Have we heard from folks in this neighborhood at all? Um, and uh, so those are my two things that I would ask staff to maybe reach out and find for me. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Bernie. 
Thank you. Uh, yeah, this has been a very, very helpful discussion. I think I agree to put it on kind of on, on hold till we get a little more information. I was looking at a couple of things. Uh, one of them is nothing has been mentioned about the PGE light that's on the property. So um, would there have to be access to that? Uh, the other thing would be, will there be a need in the future for us to be laying something like fiber optic lines or something where we need the public right away or something to do, um, you know, as a possibility. Um, but those are kind of uh, off on the side. I think well, one thing I wanted to ask about is there a possibility of connectivity if you look further south on the map. Um, and this is because we don't have access to the parking lot. It, would there be, could we connect over to something like Wilbur or, or I think there's another street even. I'm just thinking about other alternatives for connectivity. Um, I'm pretty much thinking out loud. I don't know if I have a specific question for staff, but I'd like to know what alternatives we might have. For Thank you, for Councilor Mr. Kamalo. Are there alternatives for connectors over in that area that might work? So, um, yeah, as I touched on earlier, the, um, uh, there are, there's Wilbur in this area, the options are Wilbur, or Howard, and Lewis, right? They all, as you can see, it's a longer distance uh, for a connection, and there are buildings, existing buildings um, already in the way. Um, so our, our belief was that uh, that made Cross Street uh, the more realistic, more uh, more attractive uh, option for a potential connection in the future. Thank you. Thank I you. guess I have a follow up to that, Mr. Kamalo. If we were to say pick Wilbur, to me it looks like that that connects right into a parking lot. Where would where would we connect it to? Well, Wilbur continues over here. Right, but there's a building in the way. Exactly, which was which was why we found. Uh, Wilbur to be a uh, an inferior uh, option for a potential connection down the road. Okay, gotcha. Thank you, Councillor Hoy. That's weird to say. Go ahead, Councillor. I bet you're on mute. You're on mute. Well, there it is. Thank you, Mayor Hoy. I really appreciate the opportunity to share about this. This particular issue stuck out to me, and I, I guess I just want to, um, I feel encouraged that my um, instincts were right, that something just isn't quite right here. And I want, um, I'm thankful to staff that they'll take another look at this and that we can do the best for the for the city as a whole. So thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Mr. Atchison, some guidance on where we stand and options going forward. Mr. Oh, Atchison, 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 City Attorney. I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't catch your last. Sorry, I, I had an aside there. Mr. Gamal, if you could stop sharing for a moment, thanks. I think council uh, that staff has the, the direction that you need. So I think procedurally, you need to decide whether you want to close the hearing, keep the record open, or uh, continue the hearing to a date certain. Uh, you could continue to take testimony at that point. Um, given, you know, staff is going to come back with a supplemental staff report that may or may not include additional information, it might make sense to continue the hearing. Thank you, Mr. Atchison. I guess I think it makes sense also to allow Mr. Uh, Shipman to weigh in on on what we should do or should we continue the hearing uh or what would your preference be you kind of you've heard where we're, the conversation what what's your preference i think it'd be easier to continue the hearing and let and and whether you mary you'd like to continue it to a date certain or uh, just another date i i appreciate the um the comments that have been made and i have no further comment or rebuttal thank you mr shipman uh Councilor stapleton are you prepared to make a motion to continue the hearing I can. Um, I think uh, Councilor Nishioka is also prepared, so either one of us. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, uh, yeah, it's a, more of a procedural, but I, I would defer to you for the procedural motion at this point. Okay. If, if I can suggest, uh, if you're going to continue the hearing under Oregon law, you need to do it to a date certain. So the next uh, potential dates would be November 28th or December 5th. Does staff have a preference? 
not this staffer. Let's, let's go. Let, let's go to tw December fifth, Mr. Mayor, just to make sure we have sufficient time given that Thanksgiving falls in the middle of all that. Great. Yeah. That sounds. Uh, I was going to say the same thing. Thank you. Thank you. So, Councillor, a motion to continue the hearing until December fifth. Yes, I move that we continue this hearing until uh, the meeting on December 5th. And I second that. Any further discussion? If the recorder will please call the roll. Councillor Barney. Aye. Councillor Stapleton. Aye. Councillor Nishioka. Aye. Councillor Phillips. Aye. Councillor Leung. Aye. Councillor Gonzalez. Aye. Councillor Hoy. Aye. Councillor Nordyke. Aye. Mayor Hoy. Aye. Motion passes. So we'll see you again on the 5th, Mr. Uh, Shipman. Thank you, everybody. I think that was a good discussion, and I think we got to a, an appropriate place. All right. On to special orders of business. Item 5A. Councillor... Well, it says it's a motion from Councilor Stapleton, but then it refers to Councilor Nishioka, but this is a, a I'm going to defer to Councilor Stapleton. Thank you so much. Um, yes, I move to direct staff uh, to initiate an amendment to the Unified Development Code to eliminate the Superior and Rule, Oxford and West Knob Hill, Oxford and Hoyt, Hoyt and McGillcrest, and Saginaw Street overlay zones along Commercial Street Southeast. And this is Councillor Nishioka. I second that. Councillor, to you. your motion. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I, this kind of came to our, I was a little surprised about this one. Uh, I was not set out to do this, um, but at our last couple of meetings where we've had our public hearings about the, um, the MU2 and MU3 um, zoning along this area, um, it, ca it came up that there is still some overlay zones in this area. And so I called a meeting with staff um, and asked just to understand this a little bit better. Um, the reason why it perks my interest so much is that uh, Mayor Hoy and Councillor Phillips and I served on a subcommittee for the Climate Action Plan. Uh, where we really looked at um, this kind of uh, area and how we want to develop these areas to be, um, you know, really um, pedestrian friendly and uh, more higher density along our transit network. And um, the reason why we wanted to update all of that and get rid of these overlay zones is because it really makes it complicated for developers who come in um, and have to meet all kinds of um, kind of the code and then a bunch of other requirements. And so um, what we're hoping to do in this area really is um, when we look at uh, our growing communities and climate action um, is to focus on infill and, um, and really getting those density numbers that we need in order to really tackle uh, climate change in a real way. Um, and so getting rid of this um, is just kind of a cleaning up action uh, really in our, in our code and it would serve uh, the folks who are advocating for that uh, MU zone that, they, that we just did. Um, that that would just be the zone alone without any overlays. And so um, I worked with uh, Councillor Nishioka on this as well. Um, and I asked her if I could make this motion uh, with my previous uh, knowledge of the subcommittee. Um, it made sense for me to make the motion and I thank her for her second. Um, and I'm ha happy to answer any questions that folks have. <clears throat> thank you, Councillor. Is there any further discussion? Councillor Phillips. Briefly, thank you, Mayor Hoy, and thank you, uh, City Council President Councillor Stapleton, for the motion. Uh, having served uh, with you, Mayor Hoy, and uh, Councillor Gonzalez on that subcommittee, I agree. I was surprised to see the overlay still there, and uh, I think that this is is a good move. I think that we've we've got a better solution. Um, that's a good compromise, having MU two instead of MU three at this location which we don't need to add additional complexity by allowing that overlay to continue to exist. Um, so I, I emphatically support this. I think it's a good, good move to, you know, simplify things in a way that helps uh, everybody in the best way possible. Thank you, Councillor. <clears throat> Councillor Stapleton. Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to know, I didn't say this in my motion, but I wanted to speak to it now. And of course, I know staff will reach out to the neighborhoods um, about this, but I wanted to state it here that that's really important to us as a council that staff reach out to the neighborhoods and, and talk to them about the things that we're discussing that affect them. Um, so I know that they'll do a good job of that, um, but that's what I wanted to say. Thanks. 
Thank you, Councillor. Is there any further discussion? Mr. Staley, do you feel like staff has sufficient direction to take this forward? Great. I'm getting a thumbs up from Mr. Staley. Any other discussion? If the recorder will please call the roll. Councillor Stapleton. Aye. Councillor Nishioka. Aye. Councillor Phillips. Aye. Councillor Leung. Aye. Councillor Gonzalez. Aye. Councillor Hoy. Aye. Councillor Nordyke. Aye. Councillor Varney. Aye. Mayor Hoy. Aye. Motion passes. <clears throat> Item 3.3C, Councillor Phillips. Momentary while he does a screen change and an unmute. Yes, exactly. Thank you, Mayor Hoy. Uh, so I move to approve applying for and accepting the grant funds from the Portland General Electric Make Ready Program and authorize the use of matching funds from the city. Second. Motion by Councillor Phillips, second by Councillor Nordyke. Thank you, Councillor. Do you want to speak to this or should we turn it over to, to City Manager Staley? Yeah, briefly, I would like to do both. Um, so briefly, I, I pulled this uh, like, uh, I remember Councillor Anderson, uh, our former City Councillor Anderson, um, like he did so many times just for the purposes of highlighting this. Uh, I think that uh, so many uh, members of our community have really uh, insisted that we take you know climate action seriously and this is just you know in my opinion proof that we are heading in that direction uh, i'm certainly very encouraged by this motion i pulled it purely uh, for the purposes of highlighting this and to communicate clearly to those people across their you know, city that this is important um, and that real action is being taken and then secondarily to hopefully give staff an opportunity to tell us even more on the details i mean before i give it over to staff I will just say, I don't talk about it as much, but I, I do own an electric vehicle and have since 2015. Um, you know, they are very reliable. Um, you know, I, I haven't had to go to a gas station in almost eight years, uh, seven and a half years at this point. And the, the, the upkeep is just like, you know, every two years plus you go in, there's no oil changes. So, you know, there is some upfront cost, but over time, I would predict that there would be cost savings so I'm, I'm super encouraged by this. Um, I think that the city has taken this serious. They, I, I know that we looked at, you know, with the, the fire trucks, like looking at that, I don't think the technology is there, that's real. Um, but this is, this is something that we're all paying attention to. So I'd love to have it handed over now to uh, manager Keith Staley to say more. Thank you, counselor. And I, as a, you know, one of the, one third of the, uh, the Tesla caucus on city council, along with Councillor Nordyke and yourself, I, I concur with everything you just said. And this is, you know, sometimes we do things, especially with a consent calendar that just kind of go unnoticed, but they're actually really important. And this is one of those things that is going to be foundational that really sets our city on course for a long time that, you know, most of the population of our community will never probably be even be aware of, but it, they will be impacted. So thank you for pulling this. Thank you for highlighting it. And Mr. Staley, I would like to turn it over to you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, I, I love this and I'm so glad that we were able to pull it just to shine some light on it just very, very briefly. Uh, EVs are the future of transportation. Uh, when you have General Motors saying that they're not going to be in the combustion engine business, uh, by 2035, uh, clearly the, the the end of combustion uh, uh, and fossil fuel as the primary means for moving us about is, is the end is near there. So you know, good 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 on us for taking our first steps in the direction of building the infrastructure next necessary to support that transition. So we are on our way. I appreciate council support here. And I'm going to turn it over to Jim Schmidt to add just a few more comments in regards to this and some detail around what we're, what we're proposing to do. Thank you. Mr. Schmidt. Uh, thank you, Mayor Hoy. Thank you, Council. Uh, appreciate the opportunity. Uh, so tonight's council action is for consideration of accepting of grant funds and authorizing city matching funds for the purpose of installing charging infrastructure for future electric vehicles in the city's fleet. This infrastructure is for city fleet vehicles only. The proposed project is for a total of 36 chargers at two locations, the city shop complex and the library parkade rooftop. 
The future addition of electric vehicles to the city's fleet requires charging infrastructure with projected costs of $357,983. Portland General Electric has a grant program that would fund $185,609 of the total cost. The program requires a matching city funds of $172,373 and a 10-year energy commitment. In addition, each location would begin with one dual head charger with the capacity to charge two vehicles at the same time. Each charger and installation cost is $4,500. This is after a $1,000 grant from PGE. This project will allow the city to scale up charges as the EV fleet grows. The matching city funds will come out of the fleet services operational budget. Fleet services recognizes one of the 100 best fleets in the Americas and has realized efficiencies and operations over the last four years to provide funding for this project. Fleet Services has been proactive and made significant progress in greenhouse gas reductions of the city's fleet. Our CO2 emissions for the, has been reduced by over 55%. This is attributed to using 98% renewable diesel starting fiscal 2019-2020, more than two years before the climate action plan was implemented. Over the next five years, we currently have 34 vehicles identified for replacement as EV, plug-in hybrid, or hybrid. As new models become available, more opportunities will present themselves. I can lose my remarks and left answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Schmidt, for highlighting that. Thank you for highlighting the city's efforts long before you were told to do so uh, with the renewable diesel. That's a really critical one because there are so many pieces of equipment uh, that just uh, really electric isn't an option yet. And so, um, you know, like our fire equipment, like our big, you know, big vehicles at public works those sorts of things they take diesel and that's really the only technology out there right now but we are using renewable diesel and have been for a number of years and that's really really great i'm really grateful for that are there questions or comments for staff excellent thank you so much for bringing this forward and thank you mr staley for highlighting it and mr schmidt for all of your work we really appreciate it if the recorder will please call the roll Councilor nishioka aye Councillor Phillips. Aye. Councillor Leung. Aye. Councillor Gonzalez. Aye. Councillor Hoy. Aye. Councillor Nordyke. Aye. Councillor Varney. Aye. Councillor Stapleton. Aye. Mayor Hoy. Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. All right, and now we are on to information reports. I have received a little bit of feedback uh, from staff and from colleagues on council that the uh, process of go kind of going through these uh, in order has been useful so far. So we'll continue that. And uh, if that stops being the case, we can always go back to the other other way. But um, are, is there any are there any questions or comments for staff on six A? Not seeing any. How about six B? 6C, Councillor Stapleton and her cat. I know, this is Oreo. Um, so yes, I wanted to uh, touch on this one and um, and just talk about the, um, sorry. Uh, um, when you open up this document, you're gonna see um, a bunch of different things that we've been purchasing. And um, I always like to, to look in here and kind of scroll through and see what's happening. And I did so this time and got really excited and wanted to highlight things like um, the aviation planning and research services, the boarding ramp for the airport, um, chairs and, and that kind of uh, uh, stuff for the navigation center and the furniture for the customer service center. Um, a ton of different grant agreements that are going out the door and um, our body worn cameras um, for uh, just so many different things that we have um, been talking about with staff and asking for and to see them um, come through like this is just it's proof that it's happening and things are moving and so I wanted to highlight those things for our community that um, you know you you all have been asking for and we're making progress. Um, I would also love to ask um, Keith Staley if he could give us an update on the Navigation Center and possibly when we're going to open that. I'm really hoping for sometime this winter, but I know that uh, things have been really challenging uh, with the um, all of the issues going around with supplies. Yes, uh, Mr. Mayor, is it okay that I respond? Please. Yes, sorry. Um, yes. yes, I've had a chance to uh, check in with, uh, with Gretchen Bennett, who is the 
project manager for this construction project. And uh, we're looking at a opening in the winter, but remember the winter extends our, all the way to practically to the end of March. Uh, so it could be uh, the end of March before we're ready to open the doors there. Uh, there's a lot of work to do still on the facility. And anybody who's interested, I am going to be doing a tour with Gretchen uh, sometime between now and Thanksgiving. Uh, and I'd be happy to have anybody who's interested tag along with me to uh, just to, to do a walkthrough and see what the status of the building is. Thank you, Mr. Staley. Please include me in that. I would love that. I haven't been in there in a while and I would like to get over there. It looks like, well, it looks like a lot of folks. I see uh, Phillips, Nishioka, Gonzalez, Hoy, uh, Stapleton, uh, Leong, and I'm assuming the other two just, I didn't see their hands, but <laughs> so it sounds like that's a popular option. If you could just maybe, maybe give a couple of opportunities out to council, because I know we're over a quorum at that point. So figure out a couple of times would be awesome. We'll, we'll do. I understand the interest. Uh, I have the same, same interest as well. Excellent. And Councilor Leong, I, I saw your virtual hand. Do you have anything or did you were just saying, okay, gotcha. Okay, anything else on item 6C then? All right, item 6D, the Economic Development Quarterly Report. Councilor Stapleton. I feel bad because I've talked so much tonight, but I do want to thank staff for this because, um, and, and to let you all know that we read these. <laughs> um, you know, you guys um, are giving us these quarterly reports and it takes work to pull this together. And I wanna thank you for your work and let you know that I am reading it. Um, I've seen all of the outreach that y'all are doing for our local businesses and support with our unhoused crisis is really important. And I know that that is a challenge for many business owners and to see that uh, we're supporting them in any way that we can is good. Um, and then also the first Latino uh, micro enterprise development program is starting. Um, and that's just really great and exciting news. It made me want to learn more about it. Um, so just excited to see all of the great things that are happening. I watched the video on YouTube that y'all linked um, and that was really great and fun to watch as well. So thanks for your work on this. Um, we see you and we're very thankful. Thank you, Counselor, and thank you for acknowledging those. That's really important uh, to staff. I know they do put in a lot of work on these things, so it's good that you, uh, people are reading them. Are there any other questions or comments or anything else on any information reports that we didn't get to? All right, we are on to second readings, item 7.2a. I'll turn it over to the city recorder. Engrossed Ordinance Bill number 1822, an ordinance amending the Salem zoning map for properties along Commercial Street Southeast between Superior Street Southeast and McGillcrest Street Southeast. Councillor Phillips. Aye. Councillor Leung. Aye. Councillor Gonzalez. Aye. Councillor Hoy. Aye. Councillor Nordyke. Aye. Councilor Varney. Aye. Councilor Stapleton. Aye. Councilor Nishioka. Aye. Mayor Hoy. Aye. Motion passes. I'm sorry, it wasn't a motion, but the, uh, I'm not sure what the language, the ordinance passes. All right, uh, we have nobody left for public comments and no further business, so we are adjourned. Thank you, everybody. For more videos and for more information, go to capitalcommunitymedia.org and follow us on social media.